You just tra traded him the captain spot? Well, I, uh, uh, the new chief's there. Uh, okay. I retired about 12 years ago as an assistant fire chief. Uh, okay. And then when Chief Miller came back and the deputy fire marshal was Okay. Uh, I uh, was asked if I could come back and help the fire convention. So I'm right in the drum for the position. of last year. I have a couple of housekeeping uh, matters. Um, first of all, uh, we tried to set up the room differently. We got some comments. We hate to have our backs to the public, so you'll forgive us. But this was the only format to, to have a bowling alley uh, like the room. So uh, this is the format um, that we, we have to set up. So our, our apologies. Um, I'll be using the term we today. When I talk about we, I'll be talking collectively about the staff and the council. 
and the community. I think that we are you know, kind of a team, we're certainly a, a family in a lot of ways. And um, when I use uh, you, maybe I'll be talking about just you council. So I'll try not to be quick about it, but again, I'll be talking collectively. Um, the department heads and, and executive team are around the table. Um, there's been a little bit of critique, I would say, about the number of priorities and the top priorities, high priorities that we have. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into this. But I really have um, not only encouraged, but admonished them to get involved in the conversation, talk about what's feasible and what we can add and what we, what we can't do. Um, uh, uh, thanks to Bob Ferrari, it is warm in this room. You can tell because kind of, kind of your grandma doesn't have an anorak on her hat today. <laughs> so we do have a new heater. So thank you, Bob, for the heater. Um, it's too warm, we can, we can turn it down. Um, the mayor uh, had some, uh, had, has some knee issues, so if he gets up and moves around every 30 minutes, he's not supposed to sit, sit for longer than 30 minutes, so please uh, bear with us. We can take breaks. We have, uh, I guess we've got four hours to do this or so. Lunch is at 12 30. Thank you, and everyone's welcome. We have enough food for everyone. There's coffee and, uh, and some snacks over there. Uh, I think we know everyone that's at the table with the exception, you may not know Chief Miller, um, back from sabbatical like Chief Tomasi, uh, <laughs> welcome Chief Miller, he's been with us for you. several years, and the guy to his right, I call him Chief Brown, he's actually our fire marshal, also returned from the dead. Three of them, all three of them are on sabbatical, and we, and we brought them back out of retirement, so welcome Chief Miller, Thank you. Uh, Fire Marshal Brown, Thank you. and everyone knows Chief Tomasi. He's missed the last couple of these, he was excited to get back. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is actually taking, and Councilman Barron will appreciate you saying, she's taking a class on data analytics. And there could be basically nothing more boring in my mind. And she said to me about, you know, about a month ago, and Councilman Barron has heard this before, she said, uh, well, read this passage about data analytics. And the only thing that jumped out at me was this Latin phrase. And um, Mayor McLeod can probably read this, but it translates roughly to something like, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a Latin idiom and it, there's a Russian translation, but it, it basically comes down to if you try to catch two rabbits, you'll catch none. none. And I think that that is, is part of the theme that we wanted to impart uh, with you today. I wanted to impart with you today. We have 29 priority projects that the council is working on, and they're all good ones. There's no dumb projects on the list. It's just that we don't have the capacity. And the public does not have the capacity to wait until Mrs. Berlin gets her phone turned off. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we don't have the capacity, and the, the public doesn't have the capacity to absorb everything that we're working on, and then give constructive feedback. So again, this will be a theme, and we do have a proposal for you at the end of the presentation when we talk about the 29, which is to really maybe cook down the highest priority that we're going to work on for the next six months to about six to eight. So again, that's our proposal, whether, whether that flies with, again, you council uh, or you, the public, uh, remains to be seen, but that's, that's going to be our intent. So again, uh, the theme trying to, trick, trying to teach us to focus today, uh, over half the top priorities are, uh, of the priorities are top priorities, and again, we've made some progress on some, and not, not as many uh, on, uh, on others. So I think with that, Mayor and Council, I'll get off the lap and move into um, uh, oh, that was the other, the other thing. So you'll see more documents in the packet than you've seen in the past. In the past, there's been one table that has all the priorities with some information, progress, percentages, and those kinds of things. But what we heard uh, from, again, members of the council and the community, they wanted to see, you know, how were they broken down, down by, by some of the top headings, uh, preservation of the natural environment, or fiscal responsibility. And so you see a table about that. There was a question about how many priorities are dedicated to each of the different departments. And so you'll see a different table about that. So it's the same information, kind of just some, in some areas, in some uh, attachments, it's more expanded than others. So uh, again, it, it was confusing. That was not our intent. We tried to make it uh, a little bit more logical. So this is an example of the priorities by department. It's meant nothing more than to show you um, who kind of has what and what, and when you think about what each department has, we you think about the capacity. Because these priorities are in addition to daily workload. 
the planning office, for example, um, the planning office deals with current planning applications, so remodels and new projects and use permits and all kinds of things in addition to this list of priorities. I did, I, I am remiss in one regard, I apologize, Council. Uh, this is an opportunity to celebrate our newest Assistant City Administrator, Brandon Swanson, um, has accepted my offer to take on the ACA position. <laughs> uh, is chagrin, he has no idea what he's getting into, but he hasn't been <laughs> in the job for about two months, so his official start date is, is actually Monday at first, but he's been doing the job. Thank you, Brandon, for everything that you do. Chip. 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 Yes, yeah. Yes. I'd like to just back up one second. Sure. You said something. You want to see the Latin again, Council Member? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You stated something that may have gone by, and I want to be clear on it. You want us to prioritize things that are going to happen or want to happen in the next six to eight months, which may mean that something that is high but can wait goes down. I don't understand. Yeah, and we can, I, that, that was a proposal. We just actually, you know, again, part of the critique of the priorities that we currently have is that we just have too much on our plate. So we're making small progress on a lot of all the priorities, quite frankly. Uh, there's a couple that you'll see that we haven't made any, any, any progress on. But we're making more iterative uh, progress where, again, our, our supposition from the staff perspective, my supposition is that we focus on a fewer number of high, highest priorities, if you will, then we can get those done in the next six months. We'll come back in September and we can add to it. So again, it's a theme that I've been hearing not just from, from the council, but certainly from my colleagues and, and from the public as well. So it's, it's an idea, council member. And again, we can delve more into it. Uh, one of the other ideas we came up with was to come up with, with like a, 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 four, a four priority ranking system. But then it gets a little bit more complicated. So again, I think that after we get through all the slides, we can talk about whether you want to go with them, right, you know, that kind of a route, and then what it would look like. So it isn't just an idea, just a just a proposition. Question. Yes, sir. Are you a back slide? Yes, sir. So there are uh, 34 items on that list. If I add up those numbers, to the top 18 and 4 is 22, 33, 34. But there are only 29 items on the list. I don't do math. So speaking of data analytics. It is, I, I failed that class, obviously. Uh, Emily, you want to tell us why, what, what, the, what the carryovers are? There, there's some overlap on these lists because some, some projects, like the police um, building, gets three different um, departments. So the numbers at the top don't add up to 29. Um, okay, so but everything on this list is going to be covered today. Yes, sir. But I, I think that's a, you know it's a great it's a great question because again you have priorities that touch all the departments so it can absorb some level of capacity from other departments. So that's not a critique; it's just the reality. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further questions, we'll jump to number one. And I do have I do have some notes. I'm going to flip back and forth a little bit, Council. <laughs> uh, so uh, telecommunications. This has been a you know a uh, kind of a, an issue that we've been dealing with for some time. Um, we talked about consistency with, with uh, federal law. Um, this is a, we have, a, we have a draft adopted by the city council. It was sent to the Coastal Commission, so it's not law yet. And Brandon, you would to me, remind me when that was sent to the Coastal Commission. Uh, yeah, sorry, Jeff, I don't have that right now, but we are just, we, as everybody knows, it takes like, back to our timeshare ordinance, we submitted it and it took five or six months to get on their agenda, so it takes some time uh, once you submit your application for the, the uh, Coastal Commission to get you on their agenda. Yeah, and the Coastal Commission right now is dealing with, they're also dealing with um, rezoning in communities in California because of the housing updates that a lot of the 468 city, 486 cities and 31 counties are going through right now. So yeah, they're, they're pretty great. For everyone's benefit, the mayor sat in the Coastal Commission for many, many years and there was kind of the, the pace of, of projects going through the Coastal Commission. So um, my suggestion, Mayor, is that maybe we take, I don't know, four or five of these and then accept comments.
comment on on that four or five, or would you rather take public comment on, on all of them? I think each individual. Well, let's see where we are. Yeah. Are we at John Stone? I don't know. I'd rather go one by one, actually. Okay. Okay. So, why don't we take so yeah, I don't have anything else to add on on the, uh, the telecommunications. So on this one, um, is the only thing that's left is that fourth floor? Yes, sir. And then what's the uh, what's the dependency around that? And what's the staff division of staff involvement? Is this gonna, you know, kind of work? You know, what's what's the burden on the staff to get this complete? Is it just waiting or is there you know um essential resources to get the end of Right now, in the waiting period, there's nothing for staff to do. When we do get our hearing date, uh, we will we will need to review the, the Coastal Convention staff report. We'll likely attend the meeting. It also depends on, you know, this would essentially be the last chance for telecommunications providers to challenge our ordinance. And so it also depends a little bit on, and I'm so sorry if I didn't attack everybody. It also, it also depends on what we see from any potential telecommunications providers if we need to elicit a larger response to that. Uh, but once the Coastal Commission adopts it, uh, the ordinance is effective immediately. If you remember what we did, we took a, a, what I think is a rather clever approach. All the supporting documents, the application materials, the requirements, the uh, design standards, those were all adopted by the Planning Commission and confirmed by the City Council. Those did not have to go to the Coastal Commission because they're not codified in Chapter 17. They're mentioned in the ordinance but they became effective immediately. So all those protections for the types of materials we need as part of a submission are effective already. It's only the ordinance language itself that is waiting for the Coastal Commission to adopt it. I've got a question. Is my mic on? Yes, ma'am. Um, you just mentioned something that the providers um, could potentially challenge with the Coastal Commission. So if there is a carrier that wants to apply for the new <coughs> tower, do you think that they would wait until after it's been you know, I, I don't know on that one. I mean, it would be up to each carrier if they felt that our current ordinance or the pending ordinance, which one was more beneficial to them. Uh, as of right now, we, we don't have any that fall in, like, you know, one down in Carmelo. We don't have anything like that pending right now. And do you have any updates on the status of the appeal, I believe it is? The litigation? Yeah. I don't have anything. that impact us, one's called the Clean Water Act, and um, under the Clean Water Act, we are required to adopt a local stormwater ordinance, and so again, this is a, uh, another issue that has been approved by uh, the Planning Commission, has to go to the Coastal Commission for review and approval. Uh, the Coastal Commission is, you know, part of their, part of their charge is protecting the coast and providing access, so they're really hypersensitive about this, about this ordinance. Uh, we went back and forth with the Coastal Commission staff on numerous drafts before it was approved, but um, it's 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 you know largely done. The, the one the one item that you will see, and um, you know again, if you are in data analytics, I hope you'll forgive us, but you know sometimes you'll see a percentage that's gone backwards from August, and that really what that actually means is probably we were overly um, enthusiastic in August, so we weren't quite at 100 percent last year. So again. When you see those, it was, you know, it's, you know, we think, we thought we were not percent we thought we were across the, the finish line, and then actually, you know, we hit a, we hit a, a speed bump or something, we just went in. So, anyway, Mayor, that's, that's what we want to work with. Um, <coughs> um, so, I have a question, though. So, if I'm reading this right, it still needs to go to the planning commission for approval? Yes, ma'am. Going back to public, is there anybody in the public wishing to see that until? There are no speakers on Zoom. Is there anybody in the public wishing to see that until? Chair, it might be beneficial to this money that's not to the public that would want that percentage to be highest complete down rather than less. Thank you. Um, yeah, 
so yeah, they're, they're organized in a format where the highest percentage moves to the top of the list. And when we get to number 29, it'll be low percentage. <laughs> Uh, car week impacts. Now, you know, this one was added last uh, last last year after we had a, another pretty rough um, car week with um, with people coming into the village and not being as respectful as we would expect. Quite frankly, and it's not because Chief Demasi was gone for those two years. But what happened is, and, and Emily really pointed this out to me yesterday. We have those signature, we had the Tuesday, Thursday signature events, and they really absorb much of the village. And we didn't have as many people coming for the after hour car shows and the like. And even though we've, we've continued to put increased protections in place, we still are the focus of the car week um, individuals who come for the after hours events, informal car shows, showing your car off, sometimes doing car tricks. So again, what Chief Tomas did years ago was he built a chicane, so coming through the village where you weren't on the major routes and it wasn't as fun, not in the big open intersections of, the, of uh, San Carlos and Ocean, for example, where the car tricks could happen, and really increasing our presence, working with our partner agencies, getting the word out that we were not gonna put up with um, <clears throat> untoward behavior. Um, last year we talked about a sound monitoring device for exhausts. A lot of things to get protect the, the safety and the sanctity of the village. And you know, so this was added. Um, Ashley provided you an update in October. She provided you an update in March about the events that we have on the schedule for this coming car car week. And um, so again, it, it's a priority item. I mean, it really is something that will be an ongoing effort every year, quite frankly, in our part. But I'm not convinced it needs to be on this list of information. Other comments on this item? All right, we have no position to come on if we should be kind of an update team when it follows, but I think we're going to do it. We can, we can do that all again when we go back through them, but um, you know, it, it's it, again the cognizant, and then we're fine with that. The cognizant point is that this is a an event an activity that absorbs capacity in multiple departments on an annual basis. That our public safety corner that is out of course for obvious reasons. Sure, Ashley's out coordinating. Uh, the event organizers, the displays, Brandon's office is dealing with signage and, and uh, use permits and those kinds of things as well. So again, it's not a uh, it's not an event where y'all take the week off. It's really all hands on deck for that week because of the obvious impacts. Of the so fair enough. Thank you, Council. Yeah, I knew it was going to die. It died in the fourth slide. So um, we, we 
been working closely with him for the past folks. We've been working closely with uh, housing and community development. The mayor and I spent the call with fifth, fifth district supervisor Adams and um, our contemporaries from the city of Pacific Road and uh, Monterey. None of them will be meeting the housing deadline, which is April 15th. Um, we are currently on track uh, to meet the deadline, which is in about two weeks. Uh, plus, we have scheduled next is we're going to receive an update on uh, next week on the second, but no decision. I uh, just report the back and forth and we're out for a seven day review period with the latest edits to the housing element. And then we're scheduling a special meeting of the Planning Commission and City Council um, for the 8th, Monday the 8th of um, April at 4 p.m. Thank you. Uh, Planning Commission will be reviewing the document, making a recommendation to the Council. The Council will be poised to adopt the housing element. Nancy Toon, thank you all very much for all of the work that you put into this project. It's been a long, hard road, and not everybody has been plugged into this that, that we would have liked, so that there has been at this juncture some surprises for folks who haven't been. Uh, watching us along the process that we've been following, um, but we, um, but I personally am looking forward to getting this adopted so that we can aggressively, not aggressively, just uh, methodically uh, go through the uh, next steps that has a series of deliverables and timelines that, that we'll need to work uh, in, the, in the weeks and months to come. Uh, the, I think the important thing Think, I'm going to put words into your mouth, uh, Chef, is that this, the scope of this line item is again just to get us approved, not all of the other action items that are a part of the follow up task. So, thank you very much for everybody and all of your work, and uh, let's get this thing passed go so we can protect um, things like grant funding, um, our local control over building. Those types of things are at stake if we don't get this approved. So I'm kind of thumbs up. Let's make it happen. Andy Carr. Um, I have a lot of questions. I, I read very carefully the letter that was sent out with all the details from. Um, the state and our responses. And I feel that the identified properties are misleading. I also have a question about the group EMC, who um, think you spent, we spent a lot of money on this um, consultant. And the way I understand it, unless it can be shown to me, these properties don't fit the criteria to be identified on this um, housing document. We cannot identify properties that we don't own. We cannot identify properties that are not available. Um, and my question, and I look at Sunset Center and Vista Lobos that are parking lot in use in Carmel, those are not available, those are not surplus land. So my question is, why were those put on? Why did we spend money, a lot of money for this room to put them on? Why hasn't, why haven't the properties that are empty land in Carmel, like Flanders Mansion, Rio Park, Scout House, I've looked at it carefully, and from what my knowledge is, from what I've been provided, those are the surplus land. So I would like those questions addressed. And is anybody else wishing to speak? Is there anybody else? Okay, so thank you. This is an issue and we want to keep this on the priority list. I would say yes. Let's show people any questions Andy has today. Andy's right now. He's got to be part of the forum for an application. Yeah, 
people that might come so close to you. So what I was saying was, I think this is something we need to keep on the front of your list, obviously. But I think we're going to get the questions that Andy posed as to ask and answer the forums that we're going to have us run workshops on the ACT. So the very same thing is that Brandon will answer those questions from Mrs. From Mrs. Carr uh, when we talk about this either next Tuesday, second, or uh, during the presentation, or on the 8th. Uh, If we wait to the eighth, that's too late. That's when it is a submission. So the so, second. Sorry. Right. Seven. And the meeting is on the eighth. So I think these are questions that, as a community, we're entitled to know the answers. This is a very big issue in our community right now, and we are not understanding because either we don't have the right information or I don't know. So we want answers to those questions because, and there was a letter written to the state from Victoria Beach and Rich Puppy which addressed that. And then you answered it, but it still wasn't addressed in that. I want to know if there's a reason why that issue is not being addressed. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your testimony. He said that. I'm going to bring back the council. Council. I'd like to add something. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Council. 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 That needs to be addressed. And I just want to read the first sentence. This is from Program 1.1B, City Owned Sites. And it says, the city plans to make three sites, number one, two, and three, and those refer to the north and south lots of Sunset Center and Vista Lobos, available over the next five years for potential development of 149 units over the three sites. So we're still keeping that in there. And I believe the direction that council gave uh, was that these are not available sites because of the surplus land act. And, and the words that were used is, if the city makes these surplus land, then they will be available. But these are not surplus land. These are actively in use and have a very important function to provide much needed parking. There's also concerns with the Sunset Center and the fact that the Sunset Center has a lease with the city until 2032. So I feel this needs to be addressed, especially since this is the seven day public comment period. And if we wait till a second, it's too late. Good night. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. You know, a lot of people, including my council member grandma, have um, made statements regarding the council's um, the council's intent or the council's whatever regarding the applications from the city to the state. And I will say that they do not speak for me. And I was I am very okay with uh, that staff followed the direction that the council gave them. I would ditto that. But I believe the three with of us. respect, with respect, um, I do not, you know, I'm making a statement regarding me, not everybody else. So I would appreciate it if, you know, when people talk about what the council said, they take a step back and talk about what they think or what their view is and not what the council is. Because I've not given people to speak. I've not given people the right to um, interpret or my, my own words. I believe there was a majority with myself, the mayor, and the vice mayor, and the three of us seem to have the same understanding of the surplus land act and the intent. All right, I'm going to to my court call. So you want to say something? Uh, yes, please. My name is uh, Ian Martin. I'm a resident former planning commissioner. Uh, one quibble I have with the, the element, which I think is an excellent work product, I think it's a fantastic job. It's very well put together, very well thought out. There is this matter of the Surplus Land Act. And, and what the what the two, two of the three sections say, so Vista Lobos, 
a north and south parking lot say that that the city will make these lands available via the Surplus Land Act, but of course the problem with that is that the Surplus Land Act requires public deliberation for council to take a vote about whether or not to make those lands surplus. So here right now, so an, an important edit for those all three sections needs to be that in the event council should decide to make these lands surplus in X, Y, and Z, right? But right now it's like, we're going to make these available via Surplus Lands Act. Well, you can't just declare that that is going to happen because council needs to deliberate and take a vote. So, um, and yes, in the uh, South parking lot and in Mr. Lobos, it says um, that council needs to approve every step of the process, but that language is missing in the North parking lot and then also um, the overall tone is that we are going to make this happen, right? And of course, you cannot guarantee that outcome. So I think it's very important to adjust that language. But again, it's a heck of an undertaking that the council has undertaken, the city's undertaken, and the consultants work beautiful and it's very well thought out. It's a 486 page document, so <laughs> it's a heck of a thing, right? So. Anyway, important to get this right, uh, but it is important to also observe the law and communicate to the state and the community that the law will be followed. Thank you. And doing bringing mm -hmm. back into the issue of the proposal, I think it's an unfairness and an idea. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, can I, can I just offer one Fair clarification, if that's okay, I'm sure. sorry. Um, I just want to clarify something that, that Ian said, because um, I, I recognize there's been you know, a lot of drafts moving quickly, but. The, the most recent draft, what came out of the city council meeting, um, did actually change that language. So it did say before that we'll make it available through the Surplus Lands Act. But if you look at the current draft that was submitted back to the state, it says that we will make the sites available, which is the RFP process we've talked about, and that's been been the plan since early 2023. And the language was moved later to that section that says uh, if if they you know, if they are made available, when they are made available. Um, that all the laws, including the surplus land act, will be followed, but it does not say anymore that we'll make them available in the program language. It doesn't say we'll make them available through the surplus land act. That was that was the direction we took the council. Yeah, the, the March 27th draft says just what it says. <clears throat> all right, back to council. Absolutely. Okay, we only have two days anyway. That's Monday, the second. Okay. Okay, moving on then. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So the, the, the next item, you know, we have just an incredible array of volunteers and volunteer groups uh, in the city. And when I look around, you know, this room, I see, you know, Brigham Rosa from Michigan Nature Preserve, a litany of people from the CRA, uh, obviously Carmel Cares, um, and, you know, a whole, and, and, there, and that, that, you know, we've got the Carmel by the Sea Garden Club. I will miss a dozen volunteer groups. And so one of the council's objectives, priorities, was to try to have, again, we, we dealt with that last word, you know, person said oversight, that, that really wasn't the right word. We came up, we agreed to facilitation, because it is, it's a two-way street. And so um, this is, a, you know, an ongoing effort. If you haven't met Tom Ford, not only is he a rock star in Florida, but he's <coughs> back here in that, he's Philadelphia as well. Thank goodness. That's not why, why I hired him. But um, he, um, He's a great person. He works with a lot with our urban forestry, and but he also works with our volunteer groups. Um, and he, along with, with the team over here, have updated the, um, the website. So there's a volunteer page, how to get involved. There's a list of, you know, you move to the, you move to the community and you want to get involved in the library. And there's a, a pull down, how you get in touch with. So uh, thanks to, again, Emily and, and, and Nova Ashley and everything, and Tom about updating that. So again, this is this is a priority that you know shows at eighty percent, but it's going to be an ongoing effort. It's not something that necessarily has to be on a list like this, um, but it's a great effort, and uh, we we admire your, your vision, Council, and, and we've implemented it. We're doing a good job. That concludes my comments. I do. And I'm gonna call the call anybody else to um, I just wanted to say this was one thing that I thought was very, very important. I am 
not sure it shouldn't just become inherent in every department and not necessarily have to take up a space of a priority because it just should become part of how we do business. We facilitate the people that help us do our city jobs better and with uh, more efficiency and more community involvement. I think it should just become inherent. I agree. I think this is the same. I think the, the reason here to agree with uh, Karen is the same. Yes, as, the, mic. the reasoning here is the same as the car week stuff. Um, this is something that I think the city does as a matter of course, uh, you know, throughout the year. And I'm glad that we have this on the priority list for the, the time that we did to facilitate sort of the creation of, of <coughs> whatever infrastructure there is. I agree. I think three years ago this was a priority, and we hit our priority by hiring somebody like Tom, who doesn't do a great job of thinking Tom. But I don't see why it's still on the list. Yes, Yeah, so this was an item that, um, you know, training, the training overall, you know, kind of waxes and wanes. Um, but this was added, and, and this was a this was a good ad council. Um, so um, Noah has been working with the city attorney, Mr. Pierre, whose pictures over he's, he's on he's on uh, virtually with us, and we updated the commission for commissioner handbook, and uh, we need to do some more editing based on your direction. Um, I think that this this is still a, a fairly important piece of what the council board commission staff relationship is is about. So um, it needs to stay on the list somewhere, whether it's a high priority. Again, we, we postponed uh, adoption of the handbook uh, recently, but again, uh, something we should have. No, but it's going to be correct here with you, I've said. Uh, no, I just, I forgot to add something to the slide, was just that um, I'm working with the city attorney to do more frequent um, training for um, boarding commission members for like Brown Act. Um, obviously, we're going to keep going with the ethics training that's required every two years and things like that, but we are going to do more frequent um, other training with them, and um, so even if there's people that have been on commissions for years and years, we will encourage them to take it just as a, like, a refresher, and then obviously for anyone new, they'll be required um, when they just appreciate that. Thank you. If council your references, I would say that um, so we operate to end up the handbook for us to leave it on, but it's not a high priority. Agreed. Yeah, I agree with that, but I have a question. Um, you know, the, the handbook came to the council meeting in February and then it kind of disappeared. And there really wasn't there wasn't any discussion about why it disappeared off the agenda or what the objections were. Um, it just kind of disappeared. If we have a little bit of explanation. You know, Chip or Brian as to what the issues were with the handbook. Uh, there were there were uh, some uh, there were some typos. There were some questions that I needed to answer. Uh, Toledo asked me about about um, there was a, a matrix of, of positions. One one of draft one of the draft friends, uh, the city engineer. So it's just a, it, it just a kind of clean up. That'd be my my uh, answer to your question. So when. When do we expect it back? Like, is, are there revisions to the handbook based on the feedback from Councilmember Polito and others? Are those finished? Brian, are you trying to say something? Well, um, I just wanted to add that um, uh, we'll we'll be prepared to return that uh, to you for further consideration at whatever time Council deems appropriate. I think it's a matter of scheduling, Mr. Barron. Okay, so we'll leave it on temporarily, but not make it at the high priority. We'll get it on home. I do have one question about it, Dave. Sure. So if we're redoing the new handbook and we approve that new handbook, um, I hope it includes an onboarding uh, type of meetup when a new commissioner comes on, that it, they're not just handed a notebook, that somebody sits down with them and talks over um, what that means, so that they're really familiar with their duties, their expectations.
questions, how to run the meeting, and et cetera. Thank you. That's a great idea. Well said. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, you didn't open for the public service. Mr. Martin is the public service. Right here. Right here. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, everybody. Yeah, back in 2014, when I was when I was put on the planning commission, I was just like, here you go, kid. And it was very raw. I was very green, as many of you will, re will, will recall. And I had to figure all that stuff out in the pages of my phone and did it all. All right. So I will tell you what. Please keep the training a high priority for future board members and commissioners. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well said. Anybody else? All right, well, council, should leave it on, but we're going to get it addressed fairly soon. Well, again, I think this is one of the things that maybe doesn't have to be necessarily on here. It just be, should become the way we do business. Yeah. It should become inherent in every department when they have a commission that they're involved with that that training take place. It, it will once you establish it. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, I'm I not sure we have to. Once it's established, keep it on this. I think you're right. If we get to a steady state, you know, we're reestablishing by uh, redrafting the handbook, and then we get into the rhythm. Um, but again, what, what you've done is that all board and commission um, expire at the same time. So we're going to get a new, right? So we're going to get a new, you know, a new raft of board and commissioners. So we'll, we'll be on a schedule where they're not expiring at different times when we get new people, unless someone goes off uh, on a second. Thank you, Council. Uh, the, the next item is the uh, ADU ordinance. And you know, my, my, my uh, excuse explanation for this one was, well, HCD is burdened with dealing with all these housing elements. And Brandon said, no, you're entirely wrong. There's an entirely separate division or department at HCD that deals with, with, uh, with accessory dwelling units. So again, we fired off a draft that was um, reviewed by the Planning Commission, and we're just waiting to hear back from them. And so that was uh, in, the, in the late fall or early winter, so it's time for us to kind of get back um, on their radar and say, when are you going to get us our comments? Do we expect that to be resolved fairly soon then? Um, I, I don't know. With, with, I, I would argue that in, before we get back to you in September, which would be six months from now, that we'll have Better update, yeah, to fairly resolved. Greg's nodding his head, Mr. Mayor, so I think the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody wish to public with the Anybody wish to public with the comments? Anything, but you know, right? No, no. Somebody did this. Okay, good. Are you guys ready on that one? Anything else? Okay. Please address. Yeah, so the operative word uh, under this priority was explore. And, um, <clears throat> Uh, Councilmember Colito, who is the ad hoc committee on street addresses, has done a lot of work. She's worked with, again, public safety uh, folks in the corner. Um, Mr. Pierre, the city attorney, has written a uh, brief tome on, on uh, the fire code and building code. Emily Garay has been on point from the staff perspective, and she is now an expert in 12,000 pages of U United States Postal Service code management practices and whatever else and so um, uh, the, the exploration I, I would say and I don't want to uh, I'll ask council member to leave it again correct me but I think the exploration um, phase of this is basically <coughs> done and you're poised to present the findings to the council is that correct yeah yes that is correct and I do want to, to relay everyone's anxiety today the post office sent us a letter that said if we assign addresses, they will not close the post office. So that is a relief. They will not close our post office. This is not mail delivery. And uh, yes, we have had um, a good meet up with the law enforcement in the town and so on. And we will be presenting at a very near council meeting what the next steps are. Oh, Adam, did you get you have some help from Mike Brown too? I think he deserves a shout out. Didn't he give you some help? No. <laughs> no. I don't know why uh, Mike Brown is on it. No. Mike, Mike Brown, I believe, was working with Emily for yeah, quite a while. I met with Mr. Brown four or five times. He had really great track he had really great insight. Um, he's been working on this for years. Uh, he's been doing it with the 
<laughs> a little bit of history on this. We, when I was mayor, we had a, a visit with the two top people from San Jose with the post office department and talking about their view of street addresses. And they have obviously no objection. They just didn't want it to leak. You know, whether it's still going to be the same answer, I don't know. But uh, if, you, if you have street addresses, it doesn't mean you're going to have door-to-door -door mail delivery or even house, uh, house mail delivery. Uh, so that is the problem. And the next step for them, for them was if it has to be something door-to-door, -door, it's going to be those anodized aluminum boxes at the end of each block or every two blocks, which of course raises a problem for people who are not uh, uh, who are gimpy like me, why having to walk a block or two to get to where their mailbox is. So um, if I would urge you, if you're really going to move forward, uh, talk to them, talk to the post office again, and see what their stories are now. Well, I can assure you there is no mail delivery in any of this proposal <coughs> at all. Uh, hello, me again. So the post office building, I, I am under the impression that it's a privately owned building, and I'm curious to know when that lease is up with the post office. Yeah, when, by two families. Owned by two families, as Mayor McLeod points out. So I would like the city to check into that, because if the, these families decide not to renew the lease, then what? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Rich Pepe. The only thing I would say, and I'm on the fence with uh, street addresses or not, I'm really not here to really make that kind of decision, but with regards to a letter from the Postal Service saying that they would keep the post office in downtown Carmel if we implemented street addresses. That, I would think, is, in my opinion, isn't worth the ink that's on the paper. Because government agencies are known to change their mind, whether it's next year, five years, 10, 20 years from now. I think whatever decision you make, those street directors should not take that into consideration at all. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else who should testify? Anybody? The question is, where are we the time of the year? Okay, we're going to run. All right. We're done. We're done. We're done. Thank you. Yeah, a large portion of the city is in a high fire severity zone, the Northeast neighborhood. Um, that's been expanded in some of the more recent um, Cal Fire maps. We're also bounded by our 34 acre um, Mission Hill Nature Preserve and Pescadero Canyon, which we share with, um, on the right side. Yeah, with, with, uh, uh, Pebble Beach, or whatever the conservancy is called, Del Monte Forest Conservancy. So um, this is obviously a you know very very important uh, matter. Um, Brandon and I had on the uh, community government affairs director from Pacific Gas and Electric on our blog last week. I guess you went back. I had her on, uh, Gina Arnold, and uh, you know um, one of my questions to her is: It seems like PG&E has moved into this very protectionist posture. She said, absolutely, because of the wildfire fires that have been happening around the state of California and some of which are caused by the infrastructure. So th this was added again, necessarily so. Um, the first bullet is, I call it a SWIP, and this was actually, we started, um, a, a few panels or I started working on this pre-pandemic, trying to get the three cities, um, three of the cities that are covered by Monterey Fire, in our partnership agreement, City of Pacific Grove, Monterey, and the City of Carmel by the Sea to um, develop a community uh, wildfire protection plan, which is it has been drafted now, done by DUDAC engineer, DUDAC consulting firm that specializes in this kind of thing. So um, the SWIFT was presented to Forest and Beach Commission, correct? And um, and there's again Chief Miller's here and, and uh, Chief Brown, and so eventually we're going to have another 
another community meeting coming up with Carmelites here, probably in this room, to talk about it. Um, again, in Chief Miller, Chief Brown, the Fire Marshal are very familiar with, again, the necessity to um, drive around the village, making sure that weeds are knocked down, that spark arresters are on chimneys. Um, they, they, they will come onto private property if requested, but they're not going to go into people's backyards uh, uninvited. So again, I think we're going to see kind of a, a renewed sense of uh, uh, partnership between local government, which is us, and, and private property owners. Um, the other the other element of this is that Ashley and Wanda Palmer uh, from from CERT and the VIPS and the police department have put on a um, a community meeting on on winter storms. So it's, it's disaster preparation basically. And we have another one of those scheduled for, for June. June 1st. June 1st. It's June 1st. You heard it here first. And um, so again, this is you know under the banner of just making sure that we uh, protect ourselves from natural disaster, uh, reduce fire risk, ladder fuel, fire fuel, investing financially into our natural areas and to our landscape maintenance, uh, thanks to Bob and, and his team and the forestry division. So you know, again, this is something that should be a top priority, but it may fall into the realm of business issues, things that we continue. I think that what happened with some of these items is, before, before this current council was here, some of these things just kind of went away, and we forgot about them. So they became a priority based on committee input, staff input, council input, and so we reinvigorated our attention to some of these measures. So, I think that concludes my diatribe on that one. I was to ask, what about the changing format for the um, insurance in these days, where they're making requests of people that can't be accomplished in this village? There's a communication. So you got to remove a, throw a brush from the ground up. You have to like 16 feet combustible materials, fences, wooden fences, those kind of things. They're not in this community at all. Can you what was that, I did, what, uh, was the, what was the question? The, the mayor was suggesting that um, insurance companies are leaving California yes. and regions like ours because of our urbanized for the nature of our urbanized force. Yes. And so, um, what can we do proactively to either work with insurance companies, with private property owners, to ensure uh, that people can get insurance for a reasonable yeah. price, but also keep their property safe? I mean, that's a good question, Mayor. And as Everybody here is probably well aware. A lot of your friends uh, and family might probably have their uh, policies canceled, and there's really not a whole lot that we can do about that from a fire protection standpoint. But uh, what we can do is make sure that we're interactive in the community and that we're doing our annual fuel reduction and doing our inspections throughout both commercial and residential properties throughout the city. Uh, the community wildfire protection plan is also a part of the bigger picture uh, where we're collaborating with all our partners. Um, but as far as the insurance itself goes, I really can't speak to uh, what their priorities are or how they're going to be looking at each individual property uh, based on um, where this location is within the city. I would hope that maybe there's some way as an advocacy group, you know, you guys are probably respecting the public safety realm, you can advocate for it in some form, mm -hmm. maybe at the state level, where we go ahead and tell you to the state. Is that unacceptable with the insurance company to do it? I agree. So, I agree. Chief Miller, I know you live in, in Delphi Forest. Yes. It triggered, it triggered something when you were speaking. I was, I was there listening inherently, but um, the, the, what I heard from someone, maybe it was from the fire, uh, the of some kind, is that actually a community that adopts a SWIP, actually, when you show that to your insurance agent, they're, they're, they're resting more assured that, again, the community as a whole has its arms around the challenges of living in urbanized forest. So um, not something that I know yeah. factually at this point in time, but I, we can certainly look into it there if that would be a factor. I'm happy to call my insurance agency genius. I, so, I will do a follow-up on that, Chip, for sure. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jimmy, again. Um, part of the fire risks that are a part of our village is tied to trees. Uh, as is acknowledged on the slide. Um, and uh, most of us, or many of us, love our trees and want to see them healthy and well cared for. And I know that 
City Public Works is uh, on that path to make sure that things like dead trees and, and sick trees are taken care of in the public space. But I wanted to kind of reinforce that uh, it's, it's essential as we look to have a thriving and well-maintained forest uh, as a part of our cultural heritage, as a part of our quality of life, as a part of the walking around in shade versus uh, blasting sun, etc. cetera, uh, the, the air that is processed uh, via those trees, that trees are an important part of what is Carmel by the Sea. I'm preaching to the choir, most everybody here. Um, and I just would like to see reinforced as we go forward on this planning that, that the right trees are placed in the right place, uh, knowing that trees should not be planted underneath uh, power lines uh, and or trimmed to accommodate power lines so that they're not in each other's space, etc. cetera. Um, so again, my message is just let's keep trees and the health of our uh, village in the forest by the sea as a part of a go forward plan. Thank you. Anybody on? Craig the Ambrosio. Um, I uh, have a smile because my uh, master's thesis was on insuring, insuring uh, forest lands in the United States back 50 years ago. Anyway, um, I would encourage Chief Miller to reach out to friends of Mission Trail Beach Preserve and take a walk with us and see how we've been uh, removing fire fuels within the preserve. Uh, the previous chief did the same, and it would be uh, very helpful for us. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else questions, please? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, I would, um, I would kind of disagree with the chip respectfully, but I would leave this as a priority all the time. I think we should be always aware of this, always looking for better ways to protect ourselves, and it just should remain on our list as a top high priority. I, I would agree, and also, one thing that does bother me is this idea that our fire um, department cannot go on private property to inspect backyards. Um, I have neighbors that don't clear their um, downed wood and their weeds and so on, and you're only as safe as your neighbors in some ways. And sometimes the only way for uh, those things to get cleaned up is if people get a notice that it must be cleaned up. So I think in addition to what's on this list, we should be looking at how we could maybe have a blanket um, legal way of accessing private property that if somebody absolutely doesn't want you on their property, they could opt out of, but that this uh, type of vehicle would make for it to be okay for each property to be inspected if there was either a complaint by a neighbor or if there was um, specific times that an announcement could be made that the fire department will be coming around and doing their inspections, please clean up your properties, get your sparks registers ahead of time and so on. Because I think every time I open a letter that comes from State Farm, I am shaking. I really am because it's it's critical in this state uh, to solve our insurance problems. But until then, I do understand that the more you do to make your property safe, the better argument you have when and if you get a notice or when you go shopping for new fire insurance. So this should stay a priority just because of our topography, our geography, where we live. Um, cycles of drought, and then when we get lots of rain and we get the grasses that grow, we might have to mow them twice a year instead of once a year. So, yeah, this should remain a priority and it should be continually updated and it should be part of our messaging into the community about the seriousness of this issue. 
Okay. Yeah. 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 I'd like to respectfully disagree with some of the regulated property rights, and I uh, would not be in favor of having a mandatory thing where fire officials go onto people's property. It can be voluntary, you can send a note out, but you cannot just have officials going on people's property. I think um, so I, I tend to be <coughs> more with Karen and Alessandro, maybe two thirds of the way over, but I think that you are. You know, Jim, I think that your comment about you know this issue at the beginning is really a policy discussion that the council should have. I don't think that's a staff level. You know, there's a disagreement on the council, obviously, with regards to what um, you know what the rights, what my rights are as my neighbors creating a real fire hazard. And maybe in uh, maybe in Pebble Beach, it doesn't matter so much um, because the houses are are, are far apart. And if you know if my neighbor's house burns, you know the chances of my house burning maybe are not all that great because I'm separated by a couple of tenths of a mile. But we're on four thousand foot lots, and if my neighbor's house burns, so I'm fortunate that my neighbors generally keep up their property. But you know it would be a concern to me, and if this is not with me. It's not just an insurance concern. I mean, it's a fire concern. That if my neighbor's house burns because they need pine needles on their roof, on their wood chip roof, or they have um, you know trees planted by the windows, and the and the and the fire gets inside their house through that mechanism, um, that really affects my house. And so we, you know, this is a this is a conversation I think that um, the, the council should have, uh, not staff. And I think it's important that we sort of get this ironed out. I appreciate that the the SWIFT um, is sort of you know agreed to between you know those three communities, but to some extent our communities are all a little bit different. And you know, um, in the back of my head, I'm wondering whether it's right um, to have one one document, you know, one document sort of that applies to to all three communities, and whether it's sort of most common denominator documents such as might be contemplated there um, goes far enough to protect you know all of our homes here uh, sort of from each other the, the, um, the swift serve it's, it's one document served with like three different chapters so it's specific to our village so it's not a it's not more of a you know we'll, we'll send that we'll, we'll yeah. send that out to everyone and again eventually council group but we, it's good reading material but it's very specific to our to our village and, Attributes that we have versus Pacific Grove or Monterey. I'm sorry, I was just gonna, <clears throat> that's correct. So, um, each individual community was looked at for specific hazards, so it's not just the one blank at all, it, it's three separate kind of evaluations of the type of hazards that are present in each one of the communities. And then, the other thing I was going to say also is if anybody uh, in the village at any time has a concern about a fire hazard. Uh, whether it's a neighbor or a commercial property, all they have to do is call us and we will go and knock on the door and say, hey, we can advise of a potential hazard. But we'll try to do it the right way, knock on the door, make communication with the homeowner and see if we can get to them to work with us to get that think, hazard yeah. removed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. For yeah. that. And as I sit here and process of what you're saying, I think that that might, that might alleviate a lot of my concerns. You know, if I had a neighbor that wasn't cleaning up their yard or something like that, um, but I still think that that's a, you know, so maybe not 50, 50, not 2 1 or whatever. But I think that um, that's still a discussion, you know, that's still sort of a longer discussion that we might, we might have at a Monday council meeting or something like that, um, sort of in a slightly more, slightly more formal than this, but less formal than, yeah. than a Tuesday meeting. Yeah. Um, get that out of I walked with a uh, um, um, resident yesterday and um, we had a great, a great walk, great talk. But she would like to have a lower threshold for business abatement. And we were in the commercial district, but and she lives up there. Then in Morris, almost in the county. But it was, it was in the same vein of, of property management and maintenance. And um, you know, again, you think about the nuisance, nuisance abatement. Um, it's, it's a pretty th high threshold. Our code is written at a pretty high level. Rough inner city level, but it's not, you know, it, it, it could be more more rigorous, and, and that would certainly be served in our policy. 
policy discussion that we could delve into at some point in time. So what is it? Are you kind of a perpetually in process kind of program? Yes, sir. So maybe, maybe it's not a high priority, but maybe it stays on the list so we continue to touch base. I mean, again, this is the council, and the previous couple of councils are the ones who have been investing more, spending more money um, into fuel load reduction, uh, landscape maintenance, those things that are not only beautification, but they're also, again, uh, fire safety issues as well. So you'll see that in incoming budgets as long as we can afford it. Yeah, I'd like, I kind of like to leave it, you know, I, I know we're going to discuss carrying down the high bar rate, but apparently at the end of the meeting, but for now, I kind of like to leave it high until I see sort of a, I would feel more comfortable if we left it that way until there was some resolution to the, to the SWIFT stuff, the EWPE stuff, and some, some progress there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the next item, again, we've got a couple that are kind of in the same vein. You're going to see beautification as number 11, but number 10 is the urban forest management plan. And again, you know, this, this has to do with beautification, and it has to do with urbanized forest, and it has to do with, with, uh, with, with safety issues. So, um, you know, uh, I get, I get wire brushed by the community on, you know, some people think we've got too few trees, and some people think that we have too many trees, and so my natural question is, Guess how many trees that we just finished serving? How many trees are city trees, city owned trees? City people say 3,000, 7,200, we have 10,000 public trees. And that's probably less than what Mr. D'Ambrosio uh, had a brand new role on with city enforcement. So, um, and then the next part of the debate, obviously, is are we going to stick with our big four uh, Coastline Oak, Monterey Pine, Monterey Cypress, and Coast Redwood, um, with changing climate, what are the trees of the future going to be? And so all of these issues are being wrestled with right now in the Urban Forest Management Plan and our Forest <coughs> Commission, who has a subcommittee that's working with elements of it. Um, just last week or the week before, uh, Forest and Beach are, are reviewing the draft plan in, in pieces. So uh, they reviewed the first uh, three or four sections, they'll continue to do that. Eventually this is a plan that will come to the, the council for adoption, but it's it's a um, it's a high profile, it's a very important element of our community. Uh, you know, this is one um, that again I think we were overly exuberant back in August when we said we were at sixty percent, and we had to ratchet that back. Um, but again, I, I I'd say it's going well. Bob, please correct me if you think I'm wrong, but um, no, it's something going well. Right. See, it'll go. Just talk. Uh, not too long. <laughs> I think it's going to be well. I think you know, it was a good decision to try to tackle this piecemeal by taking the technical studies uh, one by one for the Forest Beach Commission and uh, our steering committee. There's a lot to absorb. I think the technical component has a lot of discussion and potential policy issues to itself. So we're going to continue to, to roll it out. I think we have uh, two or three more technical studies to unveil the video. The overall report has a solid working draft. Once we get that done by the end of June, but from there we have a you know continuing public outreach, continuing public meetings. Our next public workshop is uh, May twenty second in this room. So we'll be talking about the some of the technical the, the key technical studies, where we're at. Um, that's where we're at. Thank you. I have a question. So until we adopt a new urban forest management plan, we are ex expected to conform to the existing forest management plan, correct? The one that is in place now until a new one is adopted. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I see some sort of things getting mixed up with some of the new kinds of trees being planted, you know, uh, especially when I see small trees being planted where there's completely blue sky above, which looks a little more like the new plan already being implemented instead of uh, the old plan being here to. So that's just a comment. Anybody else? So let's open up the public. Is anybody the public wishes to decide? And for those, those speakers who are not receiving answers, 
Uh, my colleagues are taking copious notes. Let's so see Bob's right here. And so again, um, if there are questions that we can't answer in this forum, um, write them down and we'll get answers uh, for the benefit of the, the, the council and the community. And, and question as well. I think it's very important that we educate the community regarding problems with trees as far as what to look for. Um, I had one tree that had malaria. I never heard, I never knew what that was. I had another tree that got turpentine beetle. And if we had known earlier the identification uh, markings of these things happening, we might have been able to save the trees. So I don't know if people like to attend meeting Bob, or if we take out ads in a pine cone and show them what a healthy tree looks like and what a almost dead tree looks like and you know the in-between with the turpentine beetle it was like um uh, little white doodads all along the bottom of the tree and had i known we could have saved the tree so i think educating the public not exactly with meetings but with pictures might be a good way to go Commission, and we just have a study done by um, a group that 
has taken an inventory of all the city trees, and you would be amazed at what how many different trees there are. When I was growing up here in the 40s, 50s, 60s, the people planted the trees they most liked. There always were plenty of pines. The oaks are by far the most common tree. But it wasn't until 87 when the Friends of the Forest developed that it became frankly so rigidly into uh, trying to make it just a few trees. Our, what we're finding from people is that people would like more variety. Some would like colors, uh, maybe plants with uh, blossoms and so on. So there is a, only 22% in that uh, summary of the, the, the went out. Only 22% of people wanted more trees. So we have to consider the whole population, not just people who really believe that pines and oaks and redwoods, which are all beautiful um, in the cypress, but there are many other interesting trees. And Carmel, you know, Devin Dorfman Powers, who formed Carmel, used the Monterey Pine downtown because they go so fast. And, you know, if you read some of the material, you will see that that was part of their uh, impetus in doing that. So, we don't so much need that now. We, uh, and we do see the Monterey Pine, the older ones, uh, causing problems just down the street on 10th. This uh, one of the houses that was the pine still on. Anyway, maybe we need to look at the little closer. I'll go on. In this plan, is it possible that we could maybe reduce fees for trimming or have some sort of a, um, like consultation for people, a, a complimentary consultation on a tree so that it doesn't cost somebody $300 to not look at a tree or $500 to trim a tree? Uh, yes, that's, that's a policy um, question, absolutely, for trimming. You we're updating our fees now based on, on um, English, and so you'll be seeing it as part of the budget. Um, you know, I, I, I'll always argue that we provide a higher level of service than our contemporary um, communities. But um, yes, I, that could certainly. Well, something like this, I think that people might feel like uh, maybe their tree's dead, but it's not, or maybe it is, and it should go through. Whatever it may be, but I think that if we offer free consultation for a tree to our residents. I'm going to add in on Chip if, that, if I could. I think you make an important point that we're going to be coming to you over the next couple of months with a budget, and every year we bring the full list of fees for you to readopt. So we don't have to necessarily wait for this plan to be done for the council to have that conversation. So we can have that certainly in the next couple of months as we come to you with budgets. Yeah, that's a fair If I may comment on that also, um, this plan doesn't include what the fees should be. But just like like that chip and then and then some of the uh, schedules, policy decisions of council. In terms of having free consultations, we did that up until maybe two years ago. We had an enormous number of requests to quote, just come out and please look at my tree. It takes time. It takes time. Every single time we have to do that, there's there's real cost to the city to get out there, lock it in, there's high works back to the, to the source. We used to do that. We did that for many years. What we implemented maybe two years ago now is the reduced the evaluation that we just uh, think it was about three hundred dollars. Come in and do an assessment sometimes yeah, if you're right the tree is dead or make it perfectly healthy it's just trim. So we can provide the advice. But if we go back, you know I am a little bit concerned going back to where it's always a free consultation, it, it impacts limited forestry staff we already have. So that's the, again, that's why we implemented the, uh, uh, the reduced fee for evaluation. Uh, the, the dollar amount of the fees is a, a policy decision that will you know, uh, the conversation from that. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I comment, I got it. First, when was that meeting? Was it May 22nd? Comment, yes. Okay. Yeah, my, my comment was, I think that uh, Andy and Melanie bring up sort of 
Sully uh, informs about um, keeping homeowners educated about trees, you know, Andy talked about it in terms of illnesses, and Melanie talked about it in terms of health. And I think that I would hope that the plan, this, this urban forest management plan, would have at least a placeholder section, if not some more details fleshed out about how the city might um, undertake an effort um, to do that, whether it's a yearly newsletter to all the people that own property in town, or you know, I know that stuff like that is expensive, but uh, you know, we talked about doing that it was, you know, a couple of years ago, I think, right before the pandemic, which is probably why it never happened. We talked about doing that with respect to um, building permits and the like. You know, welcome to Carmel. Here are all the rules about what you can do and what you can't do. You know, sort of hit him over the head with a hit him over the head with a two by four. Um, maybe we, you know, trees have a lot more impact for most people than building permits, and maybe we could investigate sort of doing something like that as part of this plan, so we could do something in writing. And um, I would just like to add to that: many people who particularly newcomers who have moved here and never lived in a forest. And all of a sudden they get here and they go, oh, that's a really big pine tree. I didn't notice that when I bought this little cottage. So I think education is very key to what it means to be in a forest and how to respect that. And um, I also seem to remember that in the notebook about Forest and Beach is it's part of the Forest and Beach Commission's task to educate the um, citizenry about the forest, and we have somewhat dropped some of the educational components over the years, whether that's staff time or what, but I would like to see, you know, when we're going over board packets, um, if there are responsibilities on the commission to actually do outreach and education, that that starts to happen again. Thank you. Okay, we've got our Earth Day celebration coming up. And you do a tree planting and there's demonstration, but I hear what you say. I hear what you say. And that's all. Expanding on that. Can I make a recommendation to council to leave the time? Yes. You might resurrect the uh, Out on Limb article that uh, we used to put out every week in the Pine Cone, and it discussed all those types of things, what to look for, and everything. And that's the best, what I felt it was the best way to disseminate within our local community. So I would suggest that you talk to Justin and see if he was be able to write a weekly article. Thank you. Yeah, write it down. It's a pretty good idea. <laughs> maybe not weekly. Well, maybe not weekly, week, but but yeah, I think I like that. I mean, we you know one of the outreach education tools that we do for I think we've got two million three hundred seventy three. Um, viewers of the blog as well as the Friday letter. <laughs> but we, we use it as a you know tool but this 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 that's I, I remember that. You know, this is a this is a great piece. You know, a couple of years. All right, ready to move on to education after education after yes. uh, education efforts. Um, you know you know this, this this you know the editorial on this again is this comes back to our, our partners um, with uh, Carmel Cares Garden Club and everybody else who helps uh, beautify the, the city, and this has been a priority of yours. Um, it, whether it remains on this list or whether we continue to do it, it, it needs to be, be something that we continue to do. My walk with uh, again a, a, a resident yesterday was really kind of based on this is missing the last bullet um, for some reason. It's in your packet, which again, we invested $175,000 in the landscape maintenance last year, but her request was that we actually increase that because we, we, you know, we shouldn't be relying uh, on, on just the volunteer groups. So again, that's, we'll be getting a letter from that resident with her ideas on this, but um, yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an ongoing thing. I think it, it has to remain a priority. 
and whether it's on a list like this, but again, I think you're going to continue to see it in budget sets. Hi, Shirley Moon. Um, there's something I'm really missing with this um, priority, and the other half of it is how will these uh, efforts be maintained? And I see the city going through this all the time. It's a lot of fun to improve something and to throw money at something, and then there's no maintenance to keep it. And I'm very concerned about that. Um, and you know, I'm involved with the scenic pathway, and that's the prime example of something that was absolutely fabulous, and 36 years later, it uh, turned into quite a mess. So I would like to see the partnership of the two ideas of beautification effort, and how will it be maintained? Good morning, Dale Byrne, um, resident but also common cares. And surely I had not talked, so this is not a routine situation again. Um, so I loved Karen's comment earlier, council person from New, I guess I should say, about internalizing the volunteerism aspect as opposed to making it a point on the PowerPoint. Um, we have bi-weekly status meetings, criminal care does with public works, and I think they're productive. It certainly documents what we're doing and over communicates with the city so we don't get in a situation where we should have told me so. And it, I think it's been successful. But one of the frustrations for us, because we're out in the street right now, there's a group of about 82 professional gardeners on the corner of 7th and Dolores is the city has town and country out doing things, and they're doing a great job, by the way. There's a couple of them at the time, but they do a great job because we were pulling those weeds three years ago when there wasn't one. Um, but there's also other volunteer groups, and, and I do have contact with friends of Carmel Forest, and I just met with Greg to talk about what they're doing, try to see how we can help them. But there's lots of other ones, too. I think if we had Tom, who's also great, if we could get all of us together once in a while, maybe quarterly, and talk about what each of us are doing, and even town and country, Renee, whoever's in charge of that now, say, here's what we're doing, here's what you're doing, how can we complement each other? Because as we go forward, clearly the city budgets are gonna get pushed more and more over time. And it would be nice that we develop that cross-pollinization. The city can't do everything, we can't do everything, and I think that's one of the things that Carrie was talking with Chip yesterday, is at times they, they the, the people working downtown and the media minders and downtown detail feel overwhelmed. So if we could just complement each other a little better in a plan way, so that at the beginning of the year we know what our goal is, what we need to fundraise, what the city's gonna pay for, I think that would be really productive. And it'd also be fun. It would also help each of us to recruit more volunteers to get more fundraising going and so on. So there's another level of this, but I, I think that concept would be great if we can internalize it and not have it on PowerPoint like Karen said. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Anybody else? I don't see that any reason. Yeah, we're coming back to come with the direction. Looks to me like this kind of marries up a little bit with the volunteer the volunteer facilitation and appreciation. I mean, to some extent, this is a increased group of case efforts that really depends a lot on the sponsor community. I really appreciate it. I'd like to save it. Keep us going. Yes, no, I, I agree too. And I really like that last comment, Dale, about maybe quarterly meetings be between all of the volunteer groups that are working on our natural resources. It would be wonderful to have quarterly meetings for all of our volunteer groups so that we understood what everybody's doing because we often get it second hand. But um, I like that idea of pulling in so that we're not competing with each other, different groups, uh, for attention or for dollars, but we're and understanding like an what we're doing in our department compared to what they're doing. And the other thing that I find might be interesting and worth considering, I know this is going to sound silly, but community calendars help people plan so that they don't have overlapping events. So community calendars serve 
a, a vital function. It can also perhaps be developed where we had a who's cleaning what on what day kind of thing. Like if Tongue Country is always cleaning this on the third Tuesday of the month, Carmel Cares can let that day go and pick up on the Thursdays that Carmel, uh, excuse me, Tongue Country isn't doing it. Same way at Lester Roundtree. If we know when Town and Country is going into Lester Roundtree, we won't plan a cleanup day on that day, or we leave Friends of Mission Trail, because we'll plan one two weeks later so that the um, garden is clean two times a month instead of just one. And I don't know, it's just an idea I'm throwing out there uh, to sort of have a Town and Country schedule when they're doing what and where. And I don't know whether that's how they work, but um, it might give us more coverage over each month than showing up on the same day. <clears throat> I always forget a couple of things every time. Uh, just to show you the potential that this has by all of us working together, it, we developed a relationship with MPC UC College, anyway. NPC College. Uh, we've got a relationship with them where we're, we're recruiting students now, and it's a huge potential. Two, two people showed up. I got them to work at the Blue Wings Course Theater the other day, and these two guys showed up in their afternoons. They've been working three days straight, put in about 10 hours out of their 25, they're going to give me. They've probably got 20 heavy bags of weeds. So uh, if we were all working together, we might be able to get 100 of those students, because there are a lot of them. And uh, same thing for high school. Last year, um, one of our volunteers went up there and spent an hour and a half to try to recruit some high school students, so we got like one. We spent a little more time preparing this year, and it was really just about what our programs are. And today they signed up 30 people in an hour and a half. And we probably could have got 100 there. So that just shows you that we could have 500 volunteers in the city working for free if we all were fighting it. The other side of it is that Tom's here, he's, he's stretched in different ways, and he's doing a great job. But I think that internalization, that if, if all of us became more part of the city, the city could be helping us to advertise, to fundraise, to, to build this into a, a real part of the city fabric. And, and and I've seen what that could look like, and it's huge. So, thank you. Thank you, Dale. Yeah. All right, come back, Council. Yeah. 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 All right, now we're down to the yeah, we're, uh, we're about an hour from lunch. We're about a third away through the list. Um, uh -huh. I'm going to take a bio break, or if I need to get up and stretch and get a cup of coffee or something. Good. 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 I'll go, I'll go later, it's fine. <laughs> so it's there. Uh, this one is uh, uh, Design Traditions. Um, you know, again, this was, this is one where it's that classic August versus March. So we made a lot of progress as of last, of last August, but then we started getting, we started adding to the homework assignment. Um, uh, last year in committee meetings, um, and so, Again, we, we've done a lot of a lot of really good a lot of good work. Um, we're kind of nearing the finish line. Um, Brandon has been pulled in a different direction uh, right now by me. Uh, we're in the budget season, so um, he and I have not had a, a sufficient time to spend on actually drafting the design traditions um, guidelines. So it's it's in progress. Um, I strongly believe it should remain a hot a hot, a hot priority. And um, so for those of you, again, I, I um, promoted Brandon. He's been working in the uh, acting capacity as assistant city administrator since the middle of January, and so a few months now, a couple months now. And uh, he's also been doing his job as city development director. And um, so with his promotion, he's continued to work that. I am working on uh, getting an interim uh, while beginning a recruitment for a replacement. So um, again, we're all just, it's not just him, it's everyone else you see around here has a lot on their plate. And that's part of the reason we're talking about this, right? Again, it's just, it's how much is on our plate and what, 
hopefully that add to it. So, um, Brandon, how did I characterize where we are? I mean, we're going to make some progress here in the next six months. Yeah, that was really good, Chip. Thanks. I think, you know, one thing that's important to mention is, like you said, put an exclamation point on, there was a ton of really great work that wrapped up sort of like a phase one at the end of last calendar year. You know, we, we did add some, some new tasks to the project, like creating a whole new shoot list. We have some wonderful um, local folks who are going to help us take pictures, including Ian Martin, who's offered to help. Uh, so, you know, redoing all the photographs in the entire design guidelines. Um, really what we need to do now is we put together all the parts and pieces that we came up with as a, as a steering committee and as a community. And that's sort of where the project's at right now. We did get started on that, but like you said, I got pulled in different directions between the housing element and doing this acting role for the last couple of months. But um, once I think once we get the position settled, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to, I'm actually honestly looking forward to getting back to working on this project because it's such a cool project. And it's one that uh, we've all, all of us have invested a lot of time and effort in. So um, yeah, it will, it will pick up some steam again here in the next month or two. And um, I think we'll see a nice new second draft come out in the next six, eight months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love meetings. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd like to just call out and reinforce publicly that inside the body of this great work that the collaborative teams have been working on, um, that uh, a side project that also ties back to our housing element is objective of design guidelines that is critical for our housing element and that's got to make some uh, significant progress. But my personal belief, without seeing a new version of where we are as our baseline, is that there is significant work as a result of this uh, design traditions project that is leverageable to the deliverable of objective design guidelines, which will feed our housing element. So I just don't want to see that get lost in the shuffle. It's, it's really critical for the housing element. And I don't know if that should alter any of the sequencing of what, get, what gets done when, but I'll leave that to you guys there that are making the hard decisions. Thank you. Anybody else? That, that was amazing. Thank you, Mrs. Timmy. I mean, that that was she pulled like a planner. That was I mean, that's that's community involvement. I mean, we can, that was wonderful. Thank you. Nancy can certainly speak way better to this than I can, but. Um, my concern is while we're doing this and it's taking a while, the state is coming up with their own version of what we should look like. And I don't know if that's part of this process, Brandon, where you're overlaying 20 things that they've stuck on us that we haven't even read hardly on top of what we're trying to do to see how it's going to impact us five years from now. Maybe looking forward to see how, how can we make sure that we don't get superseded by bills that have already been passed. Because that's certainly part of this. And Nancy knows a lot about that, I know. Yeah. We talked about the ADU ordinance a couple of slides ago, and you know, we, we ran, ran drawn a real hard line in the sand with the state about not allowing overdevelopment. Um, and so I you know, I we may have a pretty good fight with, with them over that, but they understand um, the nature of, of coastal communities like Carmel and so forth. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else? Well, um, it's been dismaying to me that the uh, design guidelines have taken so long, but you know, when you open up something, more things come up to be considered. So I'm understanding of that. I am very, very concerned about getting these design guidelines out to the public as soon as possible and I do think that they will help and inform when we do the objective design guidelines because we will have an idea of what the design guidelines are going to do as far as impacting our one district and so on and that should guide some of the things that go into those objective design guidelines as Nancy pointed out that's a, a very good thing but I am really concerned, and I'd like a timeline, a firm timeline of when they can it come to us as soon as Brandon can come up with that. Because I think, you know, it's, it's going in June, two and a half years, and it's not. 
Yeah, yeah I, I agree with uh, Karen on the, on the timeline thing. You know, Brandon will know this because it used to be that every month I used to ask him what the debate was. And it was March, and then it was March, and March, 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 and then it looks like sometime in the future. So I would certainly appreciate, um, I would certainly appreciate the, the day aspect of it too. My comments, my other comments would be that one, you know, a little concerned that this scope of the project is sort of increased past what the council envisioned. I know, um, and so I would ask, you know, I would ask, you know, I would have a desire to, to I would, I would rather see um, something concrete, even if the scope is a little smaller, come to the council rather than having the continual scope read. Just push the project out and out and out because uh, the projects take on a life of their own, and eventually they just die. Um, and and I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit of a sinking feeling about this one. The you know, longer we wait, um, the more out of uh, the more the less fresh the project is, and people minds, and the less momentum the project has. And eventually, the project will just die, and I would hate to see that happen. Now, we comment also that you know one of the things that's important to me is this explore reinstatement of the design review board. And I pretty much mention that every every time we come to one of these meetings every six months. And those two things are now linked, and they were linked because of some, some, some uh, shared interest with regards to getting them on the coastal commission together and also sort of introducing the new design guidelines at the same time we introduced the new design review board. And so we, we put these two projects into the same car or into the same boat. And, and, and that second one is also very, very important to me. Uh, so again, you know, let, let's see a timeline. I, I would just like to say thank you, Nancy. That was what was said say because it is the objective guidelines are crucial to help you on that. And so I think we need to leave this on high priority because we have to have those objective guidelines to help us with that. I think if I could just add some clarity for those that aren't as as, uh, as nuanced as this as Nancy is, um, who was texting and emailing the last night at 10 o'clock with. Um, more wonderful stuff that she and I are working on together. So I do want to give Nancy a lot of credit. She shows up to all the meetings. What she I answer the call when we say it. get involved and read things and have informed opinions. So thank you, Nancy, personally for that. Um, but just to be clear, the objective design guidelines, those pertain to affordable housing units. So that was, that's part of our housing element. Objective design guidelines are yes or no questions. Think of them like a ministerial thing. Those need to be developed for affordable housing projects bigger design guidelines, the ones that are what we hold, hold typical for our, our, our normal sort of development, those are still subjective and much more broad. So they, they are related, but they are slightly different. The objective design guidelines wouldn't apply to a typical development of a market rate home. Are there any other discussion? No, no, maybe try to move forward. Do you have a good market he <clears throat> yes, we've taken a long time on design traditions, but the whole point of what we've been trying to do was to take um, a set of policies and so forth and make them understandable to the public and also get a great deal of public input. Nancy, along with half a dozen other people, have been very vigilant in terms of attending our meetings and have been extremely helpful in analyzing what's wrong with the old design guidelines and what we want to achieve in the new ones. And basically, what we are striving for is a document that not only um, educates the public in general, but it also educates the commission and the architects and all of us residents. Uh, that was a problem with the old design traditions. I sat on that committee for two years. And um, it was a good document, but the problem was no one was taking it seriously. It was not being it was not being utilized, and we became very, very aware of that, having many of us been on the planning commission or um, doing property in town or whatever. And um, 
It's been an incredible process. It's taken a long time, and I know that some of you are extremely frustrated. But the problem of it is, is that once we got into it, um, it just it just became more than we needed to do. And when you're trying to write something that will get the demand of developers, residents, who may or may not be doing any development, and um, and all the stakeholders in a, in a project like this. It just is not, it's, it's just not uh, easy. One of our biggest problems is we have, for a number of months, lost our key staff person to help us get along. And um, that's not through anything but just the necessity for him to be helpful in other areas. I mean, planning is, you, you council members know that. Planning is a very, very hands-on, hard-working department. Not that all the departments aren't hard work. But Brandon has tried to do a number of things for the council, too, that um, have taken time. So, you know, please be patient with all of us and, um, and understand that um, he's been stretched thin, but he's been a really great help to all of us during this process. So, you know, if the other design traditions uh, uh, committee members have been here, they would also thank him very greatly for the amount of time that he has spent with us and, and, um, and say that um, we, as much as you, want to get this thing wrapped up. It's been a long time. I don't think most of you have any idea how many meetings we have and how long our meetings are. They're very much like council meetings. So um, thank you all very much, Brandon especially, and, uh, and council for the patience that you've shown us today. And I would hope that you would give us a little bit longer to wrap up these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melanie. Appreciate it. Anybody else? I just wanted to thank Melanie for her comments and certainly um, we do appreciate all the work that the Design Tradition Steering Committee has done. Certainly, all of the volunteers from our community who have been attending those meetings very diligently. Um, and I, I still have faith in all of you, and I know that you will get this done. And, and certainly, things have been more difficult with Brandon and that extra work that he's had to do, but I have faith that you will get this done. So, thank you again. Um, I think this should stay on a high, high, high priority until it gets done. Um, it's also important for us to know the committee has ceased meeting. The material is in the hands of the planning department now to put it all together. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So the, the committee, um, it's, I wouldn't say it's, it's on pause now in the project is to compile all the, all the parts that we've done. We've affectionately been calling it putting the sandwich together. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're working on putting that sandwich together, which is, that is on pause right now because I've been stretched another way, but that's the next task. And once the sandwich, is that, essentially that second draft is put together, then that goes back out, we'll get the steering committee involved, the community involved, the city council involved, that's when the, the, the action sort of happens, happens again. But um, what I want to clarify right now is um, because we will be in a search for a new community and um, building planner, um, you were integral to this meetup all the time. And you were the staff person. You are the sandwich maker. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak, it is in your hands to put that sandwich together and I really like some detail with budget season starting and all the other things that you have taken on now as assistant city manager, how you can um, give us, not today, not tomorrow, but very soon, what your plan is for how you can carve out that time to finish this part, because that's what's making me nervous. <laughs> I appreciate that comment. Um, I guess I'll say I'm not giving up my subway apron. Yeah. Um, when, when I was talking to you over the last couple months and doing this job, the assistant city administrative job as an acting 
we started talking about applying for it, I uh, specifically talked about this project that when, when and if I were to get the role that I'm in now as assistant city administrator, I still wanted to be have this be my project. Um, and so I, you know, that, that was a conversation we had. And in an, in an odd way, this is going to sound weird, maybe, but once we get a new uh, director installing community planning and building, I'm not doing both jobs. I'll actually have more capacity to do this. Um, and maybe it sounds a little counterintuitive, but I really will. So I am looking. I am looking forward to this. I'm not getting up my sandwich making apron. I promise. Um, this was one that I, I sort of like. Uh, uh, one of my negotiating terms with Chip in, in going for the assistant city administrator job was I we didn't want to lose this project. And it wasn't a hard negotiation. It was, it was very logical. Someone looking at their regular date for consumption, completion, consumption, possible regurgitation, but which did we come back? If you remember, we come back at the next the next ish city council meeting with a recap of what we did here, and so I'll have that scheduled for you at the next city council meeting. I'm not making this up. We do have a little Zoom issue. It's not because I have to go to the bathroom. Um, so <laughs> if we could take I just a couple, fill these five minutes to look at the audio. You're out of here anyway, right? With, yeah, had plenty.
hotels in Monterey. First tennis uh, like match that tonight at, at Stevenson. She will not be a USTA <laughs> junior. <laughs> she, oh, she'll crush it. She'll crush it. Yeah. Just hopefully. Read the packet on the way. You know, you're exactly right. There's responsibility. You guys, you guys do a lot. Ad hocs, outside agencies. You know, they need, they need to come to the fore too. You're exactly right. 100. percent They should be taking the lead on this and not relying on. Right. Oh, thanks, buddy. Well done. Perfect. Thank you. I'll tell the mayor. Yeah, they don't know. Right. We didn't know, right, exactly. No, it's our responsibility. It's all fixed, Mayor. It's all fixed. It's rock and roll. It's rock and roll. We can crank out another four, maybe five. Yeah, he's good. Thanks. All right, let's get back to work here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fresh, ready to go. 
Yeah. We're going to go pretty quick. So the floor is yours. You can. It's okay. I got it. Council so. members, if you'd return to your seats, I'd appreciate it. Crazy. All right, let's go. Here we go. Okay, we're on to item number uh, 13. Is that it? Um, yeah, number 13. Yes, yeah, number 13, Mayor. Okay. Uh, you know, so Mrs. Mrs. Moon is, oh, she's back there, but Mrs. Moon, you couldn't be more correct. Oh, Dale's bogarting her. Okay, let's go. Brandon, if you take a conversation outside. <laughs> Right. Mrs. Mrs. Moon couldn't be more correct that when you when, when you when you do something when you build something you have to maintain it, and Mayor McLeod's still here. So, 20 years ago we re, uh, redesigned and rebuilt Sunset Center. Uh, it was an extensive process, a lot of community involvement, a lot of fundraising from the community. We're still you're still servicing the debt, um, but things are now breaking. And that's because it's 20 years old. So you see a lot of projects up here that Bob and his team have repay, replaced the boiler, which we didn't fix 20 years ago, the fire fuel pump system, um, you know, a, a litany of a litany of things. So again, Mrs. Moon is exactly correct. So one of the things that we have done is we've done a facilities assessment. So we know what um, the condition of all of our, our vertical infrastructure, our buildings and the like. We've done one for storm drains. We don't own the sewage system. Thank God we don't own that because that's a, an ongoing nightmare. But um, yeah, so you know we're always we're planning uh, improvements and we're also rebuilding things. So this is a very relevant topic. It is ongoing. Um, one of the most important uh, buildings is behind Mr. Barron and the mayor, um, the main branch of the library. So Ashley and, and uh, the library board of trustees are going through a master planning effort now. You'll hear about that from Ashley and maybe Mr. Krischer, who's the chair of the library board on Tuesday the 2nd. But that, again, that's a document that will help inform um, the evolution of the library from the physical sense and, and maybe the organizational sense, how, how it operates. And, um, but also, again, educate us on, on future capital work. So, um, you know, again, I, I view this as a priority of getting to a plateau so I, we at least knew what our infrastructure exposure was from the facility standpoint and now we're pecking away at it obviously on the days blend together i guess on tuesday night you reviewed the capital work for next fiscal year on a on a you didn't make a decision but looked at at what we were going to reinvest in so an important uh, an important um, priority again i think that we're in a pretty good place from the knowing what our exposure is standpoint and again you'll continue to see um, budget line items for our facilities in future capital um, project proposals. And I think that concludes my comments, Mr. Mayor. Comments from the public. Anybody in the public wishing to speak to this item? I don't see anybody. Nobody on the Zoom. Okay, let's bring it back to council. Direction, council members. Well, my comment again <clears throat> on this item would be if we've developed if we've developed a maintenance plan, like developing a maintenance plan is different from following a maintenance plan. And if we develop the maintenance plan, then I would ask that we, I would think that we would remove it uh, from this list. As long as implementation was followed, I'd be fine with that. Yeah, and so we try to tie our recommendations back to policy documents. Obviously, some people are critical, not just in this community, of why are you doing all this planning work or design work? Well, again, it, 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 if, if we can say, well, here's our policy document, here's why we're recommending that we spend capital in this particular way, it serves as a touchstone. So um, I agree, um, please disagree, Bob, if, if you think. But again, I think we've got a good sense of what our exposure is. And now we're, we're pecking away at it through the implementation phase, through the capital work and through our maintenance so, budget. So that would be, we can't, you would be okay with us removing it off of the list? Like is the, is the plan mostly complete? Go ahead. It's, I mean, it's set right to Karen's point, it says 50%. So what 50% yeah. of, yeah, if I may, uh, facility maintenance is going to go on forever. 
on Tuesday night, we had a list of, um, I think it was council member Dramos request. What buildings do we have? We had, what is it, um, 13 buildings, eight of which are at or close to 100 years old. That's a big deal. Uh, seven uh, public restrooms. Most of the buildings have a condition assessment done from uh, 2013 to several in 2023. <clears throat> that really is the genesis of plan. We could staple them all together and call it a plan. It's a big list of what needs to be done. There's another element about maintaining what we have. <clears throat> we have bits and pieces of a maintenance plan. The problem is we have two facility maintenance workers and a, uh, we, we do have a, uh, I wouldn't say an adequate budget, but we, had a, we have a budget, but things break down every single day, including on weekends, they don't, it doesn't care. So we have a nonstop reactive phase. It's very hard for us in our situation now with these older buildings, 137,000 square feet of buildings with two people on a budget to be ahead of the curve. That would be nice to be ahead of the curve and be able to maintain things that we have. It's like a new car. New car, you know, you know, it'll change. You keep it maintained, you change the windshield wipers, you keep it in good condition. We don't have that luxury here. We have older buildings with uh, elements that fall apart every single day. So we do the best we can with what we have. But do we have a plan? Like that's the, you know, this item says facilities maintenance plan. Like I appreciate yeah. that you're, yeah. you know, I appreciate that you're reactive and that may, right. al it may always be the case that you're reactive. Correct. With respect to our older buildings sort of failing or the toilets clogging or whatever, the, right. or the buildings need painting or something like that. But that's part of, as we've talked about earlier, that's sort of part of ongoing, your, you know, sort of the ongoing work that staff does as opposed to developing a plan. If I may, I, I think we have something better than a plan. The condition assessments that identify each and everything that needs to be fixed is a step up from a facility maintenance plan. So we know so what we need to words, fix. We could just take this off the list. I have no objection. I don't have any objection. Yeah. I just that wanted to thank Chip and Bob, and I appreciate uh, that chart that you made in that uh, CIP presentation we had a couple of days ago. That was very helpful. Um, I would be fine with just having it as part of the CIP. It's obviously very important and something we need to stay on top of and not allow our deferred maintenance to fall behind because that's how we get into more expensive uh, fixes down right. the road. Right. Um, so thank you for what you're doing with that. So you're, you're exactly right, Council Member. It's, it's you know, it, and it's you know, you get a constituent who says, "Shouldn't we do X?" And if we continue to say we have this deferred maintenance and we're going to continue to work on this, um, and, and and we all have to exert discipline in that regard. But um, yeah, th that's exactly where we should be going. So don't don't the items in the assessment plan aren't aren't those the, the what we need to be working on? No, we don't need to work on developing an assessment plan. We have it. Right. We need to put those assessment plans to work. Right. And that's what you see through the CIP budget and the maintenance yeah. budget on an annual basis. Okay, so we'll move this. All right, yeah, and, and occasionally that maintenance plan will, you know, will need an update if you've added things mm -hmm. to that that are big ticket items, of course. And just, you know, maybe a quarterly update as to what has been accomplished on that facilities maintenance plan, so it doesn't go away. Uh, we constantly are aware of what's been going on, but it doesn't have to stay. You're, you're exactly right again. You know, we, 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 we had to use outside professionals to do an assessment of all the buildings, and because we didn't have one. So again, what we inherited, and we say collectively we, is we didn't know what our exposure was, what the conditions of the buildings were. And so we were constantly reacting because something would break. Well, we had no idea there was a hole in the roof or, or what have you. That's a dramatic example. And we didn't actually have that. So I shouldn't have, that was a dumb example. Um, so, uh, but, but anyway, so those kinds of things. So again, not always being reactive. So now we have a plan and we can peck away at it. That's why you see the big five-year CIP. It's not just for uh, the, the urbanized forest or our pavement or our storm drains. It's for the vertical structures, the 13 buildings we own as well. Uh, rule, rule 20A, if anybody doesn't know about Rule 20A, so um, this was the CPUC many years ago put a tariff on, uh, on electrical bills for all the major utilities. If you're in Southern California, it's whatever, Cal Edison or something, I don't know what they're called, but Pacific Gas and Electric is our investor-owned utility. And um, 
and uh, it was a it was a tariff that went on the bills, and then the money the money flowed to jurisdictions to do beautification, to underground overhead utilities, and that program's now ended, and um, so there's whatever money each jurisdiction has is all they'll have, as long as they set up an assessment district, and they work toward an undergrounding project. We have lost money in the last several years because other jurisdictions had shovel ready uh, projects and assessment districts established. Um, what the council has done for the for the, the community's benefit, we have an ad hoc committee of um, Mr. Barron and and Councilmember Dramoff um, that have uh, we've identified two potential assessment districts. Um, one would be to underground the utility line on 11th that goes into the Mission Trail Nature Preserve. There are seven poles there. It's uh, on, a, on, a, on a very wicked uh, slope. Uh, uh, it's not the most scenic resource, so we don't know if it would fit pg es criteria. The second one is on Del Mar. And so what the ad hoc committee is doing is they're doing their own homework right now as well. So looking at, um, we're not spending any money, but what would it cost the private property owner to underground the lateral, the service lateral for when the when you know, the wires underground to to the individual properties or houses, um, working with PG&E. So, it's it's a good project. We got a, a statement yesterday, kind of like get a bank statement. We got a statement from PG&E. We've got six hundred and forty three thousand dollars. Six sixty eight. There you go. Six sixty eight. Um, we don't know whether that'll complete a project, but um, again, it's it's a good project. It's a uh, um, it's, it's plugging along and I'm hoping in the next several months we'll, we'll be able to, within the next six months, we'll be able to bring a project to the council for decision. We have to have an assessment district established by the end of this calendar year or there's the potential for our money to be reallocated to other jurisdictions. Um, I'd like clarification on that. Do you, uh, I know at the council meeting uh, there was no firm decision between the two that was the ad hoc going to explore it. But um, is it possible to just adopt both of them, which would lock the money in and uh, then go on to figure out which one is better and do all the outreach? I'm concerned about not getting that locked in in time. It, it is possible to do that, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. When, we, when we had this discussion at the council meeting back in December, I think my objections in December were that it's not it's not just you know once you adopt an underground assessment district a whole bunch of things start happening and those things happen to homeowners so it's not you know homeowners are sent letters in the mail homeowners are given instructions about what they can and can't do homeowners are told things that the city is doing things and so you know if it was a question of simply drawing out some districts on a map and saying, yeah, we're going to do this and this, that would be one thing, but that's not what it is. So I think we, you know, I think my objections then and still are is that there's a whole chain of events thing that mm -hmm. starts to happen. And so we really need to be uh, really careful um, with regards to sort of what we do there. And I'd just like to add to that, um, and I do agree and share with uh, Council Member Barron his what he just stated. And my concern at the time, also why I wanted to put it off, is that we need to do outreach and education to those homeowners, and that had not been done. So we did not want to get ourselves locked into something and then have uh, irate homeowners going, "Wait a minute, what did you just do?" You know, because it's going to impact them and their properties. So um, we're trying to take a slower approach, do the education and the outreach, but keeping in mind the deadline by the end of the year. Public comment. Is there anybody in the public wish to comment on this item? Last call. All right, see no one. We got to write. Council, any other comments? Thank you for yeah, and I would just add, you know, I would just add that later on in the later on in this list, we're going to talk about undergrounding all the power lines in the city. And my view is that <clears throat> this Rule 28 district is a perfect way to sort of stick our toes, stick the city's toes in the water and find out how it is to work with PG&E, how it is to work with a contractor, how it is to work with homeowners and sort of figure out whether, you know, this is like the first step to the big project. And so I'm, you know, I'm a little skeptical, but I'm also uh, pretty excited about the opportunity to, to do this sort of exploration. Very good, thank you. All right, let's move on. Are we leaving or doing? Yep. Uh, so, so the next one, 
and we'll, we'll, again, we'll do a reprise uh, after lunch and on all of them. And we've got an interactive, uh, Emily and, and Nova developed an interactive sheet where we can do a, kind of a score sheet so we can see real time what's going to drop off, what's going to remain a high priority, what moves to a lower priority, or vice versa. So uh, develop and implement a social media plan. You know, again, this one is, um, you know, we, we do a lot of education and outreach. Um, we're, 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 we're not going to be a TikTok uh, city or Twitter or something. You know, in the last year, last year, we've updated the website. We have constant contact um, uh, distribution of information. Uh, you can sign up for listservs, whether you're interested in, um, you know, a whole variety of city topics that we're working on. Uh, we've, we updated that whole little, that see, click, fix thing on, on the website where, again, you see something, you take a picture of it, it gets sent to the a, a clearinghouse, I think it's her, <laughs> she's the clearinghouse, and it gets sent out to the responsible department, and then we fix it, and they get a, the, the, the respondent gets a, a response. Um, uh, Emily uses si simple, uh, simple texting to the council uh, for updates uh, once a week, once every couple of weeks or something. Um, that, that is a vehicle we could use uh, with with the residents. It would be a lot of information gathering because it goes to cell phones, but it might be something we could use in the future for storm events. I know that's that's you know that's at the at the heart of this again is public safety during storm events and getting information out to people when they don't have internet access and they can't get our witty vlogs and the like. And then um, yeah, those those email lists serve. So so. Yeah, that, that's kind of in the nutshell, the way we understood the, the priority. Again, um, Ashley and I have been debating for a decade now. Again, we're not gonna become a Tic Tac family or a Instagram or whatever, uh, MySpace. I think Paul's on MySpace. And um, so, because we don't know what our residents are gonna access. And with those platforms, you have to have a constant, you know, constant communication. You can't just periodically do a MyFace post or whatever they are. Um, so. So yeah, that's where we are with that one. Um, it's a it's a work in progress. Uh, we get we we actually we get new people adding to the Friday letter, which comes out once a week, right? Every week, and we you know people love the vlog for whatever reason. But um, yeah, we're always looking for new opportunities. But we don't think that a traditional social media platform is for us. Comments from the public on this item. Anybody? All right. Go back to council. I'd like to say that when Nancy Toomey posts on Facebook, I read it, and uh, she has a lot of information on there, and um, I think it would be valuable, particularly um, to alert people to public meetings, and um, people can sign up if they want, and they can delete if they want. We're not going to be a bother to them, but it might be something to start trying to create a, an email list of residents and so forth. It, you know that is a huge task, but you've got to start somewhere. Yeah, I would add, you know, to Karen's comments that, you know, Chip, I think that the, the view that you, the view that you espouse about um, social media being back and forth and back and forth is, is not one that I necessarily agree with. I, th I view social media, you know, I, I've, I'm responsible for this from five years ago. I view social media as just another avenue to connect with people. And you use, you know, you use to great effect the Friday letter and, and the blog. But, you know, Karen, Karen speaks about Nancy's Facebook page, and there are a lot of people that use that. And not with the city not having a Facebook page or not having some avenue like that, you are missing you know, people under 40 um, that don't read their email or people under 30 that, that just don't read their email or that don't have a place to go for sort of news that, you know, news that is timely for a couple of days, um, a couple of days and so on. And to your point that, to your, to your statement that Facebook is interact, you know, it needs to be interactive. You can turn comments off. Like you don't need to, you know, it doesn't need to be a forum that, you know, Emily, Emily posts some, post something on and then monitors for responses. It can be a forum where you just post a meeting notice on it. You know, Thursday is a Forest and Beach Commission meeting. 
and then nobody responds because there's no ability of there's no you haven't provided them with an ability to respond so i view this as a communications channel even if it's one way um just like the just like the friday letter is um or the, you know when people don't hit re reply um and and i think you're i think that the view that you you know that that's a little bit wrong Ashley, real yeah. quickly, Mrs. Toomey. So, I mean, one of the things that I've, I've, as we've had this conversation, as you say, for five years, yeah. is is uh, consistency in messaging. When I've talked to other cities who have engaged in social media, um, you know, the not horror story, but sad stories I hear are a department has a new person that comes on board and they're super gung ho and I'm going to post everything to Facebook and a year later they're gone and it just sits there dead. And so that trust you've built up with the community is now gone because the staff behind aren't trained in it. They don't have the capacity and that goes away. So consistency is key. And so the thing that I've been championing is not not so much don't do Facebook is we need to make sure that we have um, a staff member whether part-time or full-time, that helps the current staff maintain that consistency in messaging, consistent language, making sure that meetings are posted, making sure that we have standards for these things. Um, that is the kind of pass-through person for it. I think that's really important, whether that's somebody that comes on. I can, the Carmel Public Library Foundation just engaged somebody from CSUMB to manage um, their social media posts and to an extent the libraries so that we have consistent messaging about our programs and these are going out on a regular basis type of thing. I think that that piece of it's really important and what will need to happen is that the council needs to prioritize not only this but allocating some funds either to a part-time staff person or I know consultant is a bad word right now but a consultant to come in or a contract person to be that standard bearer for all of us and help support us in getting that messaging out. Yeah, I guess, I guess my, my and I, you know, I don't mean any, I certainly do not mean any disrespect. I think that the Friday letter is a, is a pretty astounding, is a pretty astounding piece of communication. And when I look at it, um, there's a lot of effort that goes into putting together the Friday letter, Friday letter. But that, the, you know, the Friday letter wasn't set up because of a council priority. Like it was set up, if I and you can, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong. It was set up, you know, when when Chip came to town. I think you got this idea from a sort of a previous city administrator, like maybe it was Doug or someone that had sort of done this thing 20 years ago. And that previous that Friday letter has sort of grown into the behemoth that it is now. And we didn't do that. Like the council didn't do that. You did that of you know you did that of your own accord. So I would. I would take a little bit of an issue with your putting this back on us saying it has to be our priority. I mean, it's, you know, you run the city, you do the communication, like our charge to you is to do communication. And for all the effort that goes into that Friday letter, maybe some little piece of it could be d deflected into, you know, could be diverted into some social media channel, even if it's just like getting your getting our feet wet. A little bit, you know, turning replies off, not worrying about what people are going to say, just becoming sort of experienced with it, because there really are people, you know, we talk a lot about community and family, you know, trying to get families here and the people under 30 really don't read their email. And so there's a whole segment, you know, there's a whole segment of people that we are missing by only by only reaching out on these one or two channels. And so, you know, we, we should we should think about that, you know, and I know it's hard for us that are, you know, a, a 60, 60 year olds to sort of do that. But, you know, Jeff, Jeff might I just ask you a question. Yeah. When you say social media, are you most about Facebook or are you talk about other things? Maybe Jeff, maybe Chip could just send his letter to Nancy Toomey. And she could post it on her Facebook page. <laughs> well, I think to Bobby's point, I mean, I think, you know, I think to your point, you could post a Friday letter on Facebook. Yes. I mean, you can like I is fairly easy to, you know, use uh, MailChimp to to just create a link and post it on Friday letter, MailChimp will store it out somewhere. So that would be a really good, like really tiny first step. And I think once you do that, you'll start, you would start seeing ways to sort of make that outreach a little better. Like, and, and you know, to Bobby's point and people not reading their email, nobody's going to read a Facebook post that is 6,000 lines long. Like that's not, you know, if you post the Friday letter to to Facebook, nobody's going to read it. But there are, but that's a start. 
and you you know you kind of figure it out as you go just you know in small steps much discussed nancy too is trying to say something <laughs> nancy, you it often. thanks um so the you're using my name on this and yes i admit <laughs> yes i administer the carmel residents facebook page um, and I monitor it for, you know, good and bad, you know, comments, etc. I don't allow, you know, heavy promotion on that site. You know, I'll delete it if somebody's overly aggressive with anything in that regard. And I do post a lot of the, the especially the city council meetings. And it's important to note that. Um, Again, I'm on it and keeping it clean and, and appropriate all the time. Um, and I'm, it's important to note that other people who I've uh, authorized to do so, um, especially the first time in, um, I've got to okay them to post on that site. So other people, whether it's the library or other organizations that are doing things, um, you can post on that site. The first time you go in, I've got to bless you as being an okay person to post. Um, and then if I see you doing stuff I don't like, I'll let you know. Um, but um, it's not just me that needs to post. I post frequently um, on that uh, site so or a Facebook page. And I only do Facebook at this point. I just My plate's a little full, so I don't do other uh, of those venues that are social media, but uh, I encourage other people to go ahead and post on that page. And again, if I don't like what I'm seeing you do, and it can be a discussion, so it's not just me being uh, having a big hammer on on anybody at all. Um, I want to, you know, so if you see me pushing back on something, you know, talk to me. I'm available. Um, so just wanted to clarify a couple of points that that's the Carmel Residents Association Facebook page where that information exists and and it's a pretty lively discussion and there's you know events are posted there people's photographs are posted there so it's a whole community wide with different <laughs> angles and information being shared there. Uh, this meeting was posted there a bunch of times, uh, etc. So, you know, I welcome others to participate and not have me be the only messenger. So, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Appreciate it. Anybody else? That's how I knew about this meeting. I agree with Jeff. Uh, I think that was well stated. Uh, we've been doing Instagram and Facebook at Carmel Cares for a number of years. Facebook, I've been told by Kelly Burke and others who do more than half the posts is the way to go these days. I mean, the Facebook for the kinds of people we're trying to attract, which people my age, but also trying to get younger people involved. We just went over a thousand followers uh, and we're not spending any money on advertising. You could sp we could spend very small amounts and probably get 1500, but we're trying to have it be organic, but we're gaining like 50 a, a month and we have a marketing person who's our volunteer who's been trying to get some get Kelly and me organized and standardize the branding a little better. So we could probably have 1500 followers. So I imagine if the city did it, you quickly go to 2000 followers, you could get the whole city involved. So, uh, I highly recommend following Jeff's advice. Yeah, and I would just like to say, I think Jeff's idea of sticking the toe in the water is a really good one. And if at the minimum, we just posted all the city meetings on Carmel City site, not Carmel residents, but Carmel City site, and then also uh, plugged that information over so Nancy or whoever's doing the CRA can repeat it. But just getting the word out about our meetings would be a great start. And I agree also, it should probably be co no comments because that would eat up staff time answering every single thing or correcting things. and. At, to start out, no one except Emily or whoever you deem responsible for putting those meetings out. I really enjoy getting the text each week about what's coming up. It's just short, sweet, gives me an idea of what other commissions and so on are meeting. So, yeah, get the, let's get our toe wet at Facebook. Yeah, I would, I would have one more quick comment. Um, you know, to, to Dale's, to Dale's, like, Dale, you'll forgive me comment that I'm trying to, we're trying to attract old people. Um, I, I think those were his words and you'll forgive me if that's not, if that's not the case. That's not my goal here. Like my goal, I think the goal of a social media program should attract people 
that are not following the city in some other way. So if, if the people that read Facebook are the same people that read email, Facebook is not the right platform. Like it would be good to say, you know, yeah, look at the city's Facebook page. We post all this information. And I agree that that's good for a marketing brochure. But what I'm, what I, the perspective that I come from is reaching people that are not connected to the city. And I would, you know, I would say off the top of my head that Instagram is a better, and I understand that, you know, there may be a little more work involved with Instagram because you have to find a picture, but Instagram may be a better vehicle to, um, to, to find those people that are sort of missing out of the city sphere than, than Facebook. And I don't know, you know, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, I, you know, Instagram is the one that sticks with me, but I don't, but that's my. All right, well, Rick, um, Andy, go ahead. I think just like you were speaking earlier about the gardening and maintenance of Carmel and coordinating all that, like Dale said, I used to own hotels in Carmel, and it, I was always frustrated that the marketing, when people come to town, you have a ready market of people who might decide to live here, <coughs> might decide to volunteer here, like with the golf tournaments, uh, might decide to give money because everybody loves this place. It's on the map. I don't care where you go, who you talk to, everybody knows Carmel by the sea. So I started working with the Carmel Chamber of Commerce and coordinating things with them. And I think there is a lot of opportunity here to coordinate on Facebook all the media that is available here, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, the Hotel Association, um, the, the government. There's, there's a big opportunity here to coordinate that when you do do this. Thank you. I'll bring it back to Council for direction, yep. recognizing luncheon has arrived. I'm sure we're all starving, so what's their direction on this? Could I just make a quick comment? Sure. Um, I certainly wanted to thank Nancy for the work she does um, uh, posting on, on Facebook. Um, I, I think this is important. I think we've had a good discussion, but I think we should take this off of our strategic list and just give it to administration. Ashley had some good points. Chip, you've been working on it, Emily, others, and just let, let them handle it. Maybe they could give us an update of quarterly or you know six months or so, how it's moving forward, but I don't think it needs to stay as a council priority. I agree. What's the direction? I would agree with that. And good direction then, okay. I would right. agree. I would agree to move it, but only if we get some reports about what you've done about it. <laughs> I mean, you could keep it on as a low priority, and then you know, wire brush me in August if, if we don't if I don't make any progress. Is that way you'd have Let's that instant chance. monitor. We can get something stood up by um, by August uh, September. All right. Okay. August deadline. Thank you. All right, good. Okay, we're going to have lunch now. So we're going to keep it on for one more meeting. Yep. Yeah. I want to get one for lunch, half hour? Yeah. So we turn it down at uh, one ten. Thank you.
Can we take our seats, please? Quiet in the room. Thank you very much, Brandon. Thanks, buddy. All righty, moving on now. Yeah, moving on. Thanks, Mayor. Um, just a quick word of thanks to Emily and Nova for lunch. Well done. It was really... Take, take some home. There's a lot left over. Um, great job. Thank you, guys. And Bravo's in the room, so don't harass the dog. Don't harass the puppy. Um, yeah, we have to, we got to kind of blaze along here a little bit. So I'm going to jump in. Um, you know, the background on, on exploring parking and traffic management, we had, we had a colleague who was working on this, um, who, who retired. And um, Chief Tomasi has been here for about 100 days. So it's still on our list of things to do, which is to come back to um, council uh, for some, no, no decision, but some initial direction. So um, I think that this one, we've not, dis we've not made any decision one way or the other on this topic, on this priority. Um, so if we could keep it on, um, I'd be grateful. And again, as soon as Chief Tomasi, we have other things that Chief Tomasi is coming up to speed on, like the flock camera system. We have an ad hoc on that. So again, this is something we're working on. Um, we need to we need to close the door one way or the other. Just not today, please. Anybody in the public want to talk to this item? I'm not seeing anybody. All right, bring it back to council. We have direction. Keep it on. We got. We have. We have to eventually get to the bottom of this. So I would like to leave it on. All right. We yes, paid for it. We're, you know, we're we're leasing the equipment right now. We might as well either put it to work, no, no, or put it to bed. Right. We're talking about the uh, parking. I thought we we're talking about flock. No, we're talking about parking. No. So it's for parking and traffic management program. So the thought is, Chip, you're going to bring this back to council when? Within the, or down? With, within the next six months. Okay. Before okay. we meet again on priorities in September, which is six months from now. I, I would make it a lower priority. I don't, I don't see any um, anything I'm hearing from the public that, that is viewing this as something that we should have as a high priority. <clears throat> I agree. Well, I also think, though, that when we see the budget and we go th more through the budget and all the expenses that are on there and all the wants that, and all the needs that we have, we should continue to keep this as a high priority because it may be the saving grace we don't know yet but it certainly should stay in our purview as to what it can bring in we have two that are saying low one and saying it's a high what did you say jeff uh, I, I was talking about the flock camera i know as yeah, far as parking have, i would say low okay, we got three on low well what i would ask is that we you know I mean, I can count the I can count the two as well as anybody. <laughs> but what I would ask is, if, if we're going to dispense with this, um, that we do that at a regular meeting and not here. Right. So I would say let's just keep it on the list, and at some point over the next six months, we'll hear it. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to throw it out three or four or five or six months from now, then we'll toss it out and it'll disappear off the list. So okay. that would be what I would ask. Okay. Yeah. We'll bring it back. Yeah, moving on. Uh, the Scout House. So we got some direction from you um, recently. Um, the, the, the Scout House is, is a sound building. Um, before Max left, she worked with our insurance company. We have a new roof on it. We've got new scuppers, downspouts, and, and the like. Um, it's in, you know, it's, it's, it's heated at 66 degrees. You know, every, everything's fine with it. It's going to take a lot of work to uh, implement and money uh, to implement um, uh, anything more immediately than the 25, 26 budget cycle, which is just a year from now. So our recommendation is that this move to a lower priority to explore the options that the council directed us um, just a couple of months ago. I don't know if I'm moving to low, I'd like to hear Richard Craven though. Maybe give it to Richard Craven as a project, he's not here, but he's got his name all over it. Yeah, Mr. Craven, yeah, he's in Japan. I, again, I, I think that in, I, we, we talk on a regular basis. I think he'd be fine as long as it doesn't move off the list entirely. I think he'd be okay with it moving to a lower priority for now. So but again, we'll bring it back. We'll come back in September and see so what we're in the public wishing to speak to this item. <coughs> yes, go ahead. <coughs> Nobody, ma'am. So we get her on the mic, please. 
Mrs. Condry, you have to. Uh, so Mrs. Condry asked um, whether it's it's vac surplus land. She asked, and um, and if we could use the site for housing. Um, you know, the answer is kind of yes and yes. Um, so that's where we are. And that, that was one of the council considerations, again, moving the house to another property and either redeveloping or doing something else with the I existing parcel. I'm a little lost. I mean, those were the five options that were presented to us at the last, at the council meeting, right? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> well, we eliminated some of those things. Like, we did not, like, my recollection, and I'm sure my council members should feel free to correct me, was that option number four was sort of the preferred option. I mean, we definitely did not choose renovate as a CIP project, and we definitely did not choose reissue the RFP, did we? No. Or did no, that's no. Oh, I mean, no. we made progress that's not indicated on that slide. Well, the no, you, you selected the four, option number four, and it's built into the five-year CIP for oh, next year. Oh, never mind. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. So I, we're, I it's consistent. Too much for lunch. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Apologies. All right. We have directions. Uh, enhanced fire ambulance service. Again, you, Chief Miller and Chief Brown had to leave, but um, we are working with them very closely. We're working with our organized labor. Uh, Chief Tomasi is not here. So again, something is coming up to speed on, but this is something that you'll, I, I believe, should remain at top priority, and you will be hearing about it probably well with well sooner than six months. Um, one of the next steps that we're going to do now that um, kind of everybody's back in the fold, if you will, is uh, reestablish uh, our our ad hoc committee plus, which was Councilmember Richards and retired Councilmember Tice. So Councilmember Richards with members of the community, Mr. Toomey was there, uh, Marianne Shikatans, um, Bill Doolittle, a litany of other people. Bring them back together, have Chief Miller come in, uh, and present to Brandon and the chief and I, and then again come before the council for a recommendation. Yeah, Jeff Barron's on that. Please me too. Pardon me. Jeff Barron was on the ad hoc, the new ad hoc. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Great. Okay, I, I apologize. Will yeah, I, I forgot? Comment on this item. Outstanding. Speak of the devil. <clears throat> uh, coastal engineering. Um, we got a great report from Mary Bilsey, really a healthy discussion <laughs> council the other night on um, on phase one. And you know we're 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 moving into into phase two. Uh, it's it's an important priority, whether it needs to remain a top priority uh, for purposes of this exercise or is really kind of a policy discussion. Um, with you, and again, if there's any council uh, com community members who aren't aware of this, we're happy to sit down with you and not maybe take the time today, but we've done a lot of legwork. Um, Bob's done a great job of facilitating this project. Uh, we did get uh, grant funds from the California Coastal Commission in the, to the tune of half a million dollars to move into the next phase. And this, again, the uh, the data that comes out of this analysis will, will, uh, will inform future capital improvements. So, um, Again, I don't know if it necessarily has to remain a high priority, maybe moves to the low, but again, the next phase, um, we're, we're, which we're working on right now, we'll have a better update for you uh, at the September priorities uh, workshop. Public comment on this item? I don't see so what are we doing? We got one. <laughs> I'll do a little. Um, this is really important. <laughs> um, one of the many factors that attract people to this village, whether you're a resident or a visitor, is our beach. <clears throat> and um, this has got to stay very visible and very actionable, etc. cetera. So um, I you know, put my hand up for, for that type of treatment. Um, the other thing that I would just add as a question is, uh, with this phase two that has been kicked off, uh, when do we expect that to, yeah, what's its timeline? I guess maybe I forgot that if that was provided in the session um, <clears throat> so that you can kind of give us a sense of when the deliverables are uh, in this so that again, as we look to 
significant investments to retain seawalls or whatever is the right treatment that's decided on collectively uh, that we have some visibility on when that will start to impact our planning horizon for investments, uh, et cetera. So I'd just like a refresh on that would be helpful. Thank you. Good question. If, if you wouldn't mind, if maybe we, unless it's a real short answer, just because of time, Bob, I'm, I apologize. We can add it to the, the questions. And again, what we'll do in reprise is again, we'll come back at a future council meeting. It may be May, maybe whatever the month after May is June. And then, you know, synopsize what, what you've said here. And we'll add, these are all questions that we can answer. Um, one important note here is the council was very devout last year in saying, let's not just put capital project money toward planning. Let's invest some in the actual infrastructure repairs. And so that's a bullet up there. So again, council had the wherewithal to do that. And, and, and that's part of our, our, our capital work program. What do we want to do with this? We want to leave it where it is, right? The, he, the bulk of this work comes from a consultant that is paid for by the Coastal Commission, correct? Yes, sir. So I would just opt to leave it. Let's... May I make yes. a comment? This is Laura Pavesi. I'm a resident here. And um, I'm, I'm, can, can you hear closer. me? Get a little, just up a little closer. There you go. There. And I'm sure if my husband was here, he'd be telling me to sit down. <laughs> On Tuesday, I watched this presentation, and two things stuck out to me. One was that of the 500,000, only 50 is going to staff here. The rest, I believe, does not come to our city. The second is it was all for planning purposes. None of it was for doing any real work. I was really shocked by that. Yesterday morning, it was so beautiful out, I went and walked our beautiful beach when the tide was way down. You can see a lot of the destruction. The um, gentleman who presented said that once a bluff is gone, there's no bringing it back. And there are bluffs now down by 8th and ninth that are gone. I'm sure you're aware of that. You saw the same presentation. It just really concerned me that so much emphasis is being placed on future planning without, as a theme has already emerged, the emphasis on maintenance is, um, I think, lacking. So I wanted to make that comment. And again, thank you very much for this forum. and. Um, as I was impressed before with the safety meeting, I'm very impressed with the quality and commitment that you all show. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you, ma'am. And just to clarify, so the, um, the, the city applied for the Coastal Commission grant, so we received the money. We don't have the technical, we don't have um, geotechnical um, shoreline PhDs uh, to do the work in-house. So we, we did use a consulting firm. We get $50,000 to pay for our staff, but the Coastal Commission was, it, it had to be used for planning purposes. Uh, that was a, a grant condition. So uh, again, the, the benefit of, of this, the homework will be done for future information, how we can uh, rehabilitate the work that, again, my, my good colleague, Greg D'Ambrosio behind you did in the mid-1980s, so. But it, it really should remain a high priority council. Okay, your consensus. It's north and south, good. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you know, our, our financial policies, this is, you know, we could spend an hour on this. Um, uh, you know, we we just got our new ACFR. Uh, you'll accept the audit on Tuesday. Um, we were, we were, we got a grant, we got an award again for our financial policies and practices, which is wonderful. No audit findings, which is obviously always a good thing. We've had that for uh, close to a decade now, I don't know, six or eight of them or something. But um, so, I, you know, this should remain on the list, this should remain a low priority. Uh, we don't have a, a, a full time finance manager right now, but when we get that person, Brandon and I will be working on, on coming to you uh, to update our financial policies and and review them. Um, so we launched the recruitment on Monday. We, we, there you go. We launched the recruitment two days ago. If you've any fi financial managers, financial finance directors that know local government, 
because um, our accounting system is entirely different than the private sector. Please send them our way. All right, any questions? Any questions from the public? Does anybody get okay, back to council direction? Good with the recommendation. Okay, Keep it low. So right now it's going to stay at the same status. Yep. That, okay. That's what we heard. Is the priority low or regular? It says low on there, and here it says, it says regular. regular. Sheet. What sheet? The sheet. Oh. Emily, what do you want? Low, I, go ahead. This is not just, you know, we haven't mentioned it before, but this is not the first thing that has said low up there and regular over here. I think the social media plan was the same way. Um, so it might be worthwhile to like do a cross reference yeah. at some point. Consistent. Sure is right. we, didn't, we didn't really have three specific tiers last time, such as high, regular, or low. So that's why there's some say regular and some say low. I apologize. Um, but once we get to the end and we go through the list, we can make it so there's those three levels, clearly. Or two, ideally. Thank you, council. I, uh, you know, we, we, again, we could spend a lot of time on, on the um, police department building, <laughs> police department, public works building project no defined project at this point in time. Uh, big field trip tomorrow. Uh, you have to have already been signed up. Um, Brandon will be there. The mayor will be there. Mr. Barron, who are the ad hoc members for this project. Um, and then we've got 35, 32, 32 people coming on the PD field trip, broken up into short, smaller groups, 10, 10 person. And then we only have about 10 people going to see the Salinas facility. But again, this is all part of the information gathering stage. Um, we're also trying to schedule right now with the ad hoc um, bringing the out the architect uh, who did the assessment work again no, no no plans no design no preferred project site or anything yet um, that'll that, that that'll be uh, probably in the next month when we bring that outside consultant and all the sub consultants to all those specialists right the structural engineer the geotechnical engineer the HVAC specialist to tell us about the, the status of the current um, building and then what, what we can or can't do with it and answer questions. That, that'll be a very public um, uh, meeting as well. So again, this is a, I, I, I certainly believe that this should remain a, a top priority, a high, the highest of priorities. And I'm sorry, Chief Tomasi will, will be there as well tomorrow to, <laughs> to show you around and Bob. Um, so, um, so yeah, so this one, I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time. We're again, still in that information gathering stage with the ad hoc committee. Anybody in the public wish to speak? Uh, Mayor, um, Mayor McLeod's gonna ask why we can't build over the, the patio. We can. Why can't we build right over Bob Harris? We can, ma'am, we, we, uh, sorry. We, we, we can, so one, there's, there's basically, again, there may be more options out there, but the ad hoc at this point is looking at three options and they're in no particular order. Number one is expanding the existing police building over the patio deck. Because again, it was originally designed to, to house a, another building on top of it structurally. And so we have a structural engineer that's looked at that. That's an option. Another option is to demolish, demolish. but again, Bob's building and Paul's building are hooked together structurally, not just with structural steel and concrete, but the HVAC system, electrical system, plumbing system, they're all connected. So can we not, you can't just chop it in half and demolish half of it. Can we remove the whole thing? And is there the site available to build a new police department and or public works facility on the exist on, on that property? And then a third option is another site. It's not gonna be Rio Park, it's in the floodplain. Someone mentioned that earlier. We're not going to do that. We've got another project that's coming up that we'll tell you about for the Rio Park property. But um, there's, those are the op, kind of the options right now. Again, no decisions have been made. We're still in that information gathering stage before we go out to the public and share what we've gleaned. Any other questions? So my question is, why weren't these kinds of options why didn't the project with the police station start with these kind of options? Why was there an ad hoc committee with two people that involved no residents that spent $300,000 for an architect and $129,000 for a consultant? 
I, I, I just don't understand the process, the lack of transparency, and what is behind us is behind us. But what is really important to me as a resident of Carmel is that from this point forward, I don't care if it's cell towers, I don't care if it's broadband, I don't care if it's addresses, I don't care if it's the beach, that as a city council, as a mayor, as a city administrator, and whoever else is involved, that we as residents should be involved before consultants are hired, big money is spent, so that we can give input that will help direct you and you can enlighten us as to why you choose to go in these other directions. Anybody else wish to speak today? Is anybody okay? Okay, so the question is, do we want to keep this on the priority list? I would say yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Council. Explore opportunities for permanent outdoor dining uh, in the downtown and or downtown master plan. You know, I was, yeah, I'm a planner by trade and training, so I, you know, I kind of like planning. But the downtown master plan is a major, major endeavor. Um, this is a low priority. I would not, I would not queue it up any higher than that at this point in time. You know, I was the one who, now in you know retrospect, obviously, made the mistake of allowing restaurants to go outside during during the pandemic, and um, it opened up a bit of a can of worms. Uh, even though we kept those people in our community who are most vulnerable, the people who wash the dishes and cook our food and everything else. Uh, maintain jobs um, and keep our, our local economy going not for the benefit of I mean it benefited the city but that wasn't the purpose it was really to benefit people impacted by the pandemic um, nevertheless um, we you know everything's kind of moved back inside Brandon's office has worked on all those other items that quite frankly I allowed outdoor speakers and lighting and extra signage and a-frame signs and all that's been kind of brought back in and been approved through the uh, Planning Commission through the use permit process post pandemic so, you know, I'm not sure if this is a priority of councils anymore at all at this point in time, but I certainly wouldn't recommend that you uh, elevate it to anything lower than a low priority. Um, I concur. In fact, anybody in the public wish to speak to this item? You're not doing this for the, when it's already being used outside by the coffee company. <laughs> Mayor McLeod's going to ask about the <laughs> Car Carmel Coffee Roasting on Ocean Avenue. Uh, there are the property line. Um, for that property is uh, the face of the building. And again, if there's a code compliance case regarding people being out uh, on the public right of way, then, then we'll address it. But, um, you know, our code requires that all businesses be done within a fully enclosed building. But there are some exceptions like, you know, nurseries and restaurants that can, through a use permit process, get approval to have outdoor seating on private property. But we'll look again at that one, Mayor McLeod. We're like connected at birth. It's just mind meld. <laughs> Anybody else? You know, I want to bring it back to council. Yeah, my suggestion would be most of the restaurants that have private outdoor dining space are either making uh, application to expand that or are using that space, which is perfectly within our code the, because they have private space available. I would say, you know, I've been a proponent of a downtown master plan, but at this point, I think it could wait and it might be something to bring back when we start to make more outreach to some of the downtown property owners with regard to maybe expanding some of their office space and so on for affordable housing. That would be an opportune time to maybe consider uh, a master plan that would envision some of that where maybe a one story would become a two story maybe a specific block would have a specific yeah. plan but i think that our uh, affordable housing plan could have some influence over a downtown or interest in a, a downtown master plan but i think for right now the outside dining is working the way it is through the system and one of the other aspects that we're, we're working on, and the, apparently the chamber did hire a new executive director. I've not met the person yet, but uh, Brandon and I have been working to establish a commercial property owners association. So it's not the business owners necessarily, but it's the commercial property owners, because hopefully the, the property owners themselves will have the vision to 
expand, whether it's for housing purposes or um, you know just facilitate you know these kinds of additions and alterations to their to their properties. So. So, council, what is the pressure? I mean, let's go ahead and I'd say let's leave it always so low. So, okay, I'd keep it low. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, my, I, I, I fall flat on jokes on this one. I mean, again, we purchased it before Brandon was born, before Emily and Nova were born, before Ashley was born, not before I was born. We bought Flanders Mansion in 1972. Um, it's in fine shape. It's not leaking. We've got, you've all seen my highly scientific, is the foundation moving um, uh, pencil mark on the wall. Um, it's not leaking. It's kept at a constant uh, good temperature. We went through an exercise a couple of years ago um, uh, to look for a conservatorship. Um, it, it would be a massive undertaking um, from the capacity standpoint to um, uh, to maintain this at a at a at a high level at a, at a priority level. So my recommendation is again it stays on the list, but in the next six months, which what which I want to focus on right now, is not have this be a priority for the next six months let's come back in september and maybe it moves maybe it gets elevated at that point in time i've got a question um brandon could i ask you this um one of the things we discussed with the affordable housing is an option it's almost like a rooming house where there people can stay in different rooms and then there's like a main kitchen and a bathroom why couldn't flanders be converted to that that's a that's a really good question so and i've i've, I've had a lot of people ask this when when you submit a housing element to the state and you have your um, your site list, or we've called it like the opportunity sites, <clears throat> they look at that list from the lens of how likely is a site to be developed. And they actually now, because HCD has these, you know, they've stood up these, these separate departments reviewing housing elements, they go back through the history of sites and all this. And so Flanders Mansion, given that it's a historic resource, um, and it's had had the history before it it was lower on the possibility site that doesn't mean it couldn't so it doesn't mean it couldn't be added on there in the future like if we get halfway through the the planning cycle and it's four years later and you know some of the sites haven't bared fruit or they're not working out then we can always that's the thing about a housing element it is a, is a living document so we could possibly do that but from a uh, just getting the housing element certified by the state they looked at that one and said you know the other city sites you have on there are more viable they look at viability um, the possibility that it might come true, and that was lower on the list of viability than others, just given its history and histor histor historical significance. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody in the public wishing to speak to this item? Oh, thank you for, thank you, members of the council <laughs> and citizens. Uh, this is project of the Flanders is what I call a Sisyphus project, and if you know anything about Greek mythology, you know that this. Greek name Sisyphus had to roll this huge, heavy boulder up a steep hill. Just as he got to the top, every time it rolled back down to the bottom of the hill. So he started, he rolled it up again. He, that's all he, that's all he did. That's all he does. Rolls that heavy boulder up the hill, and just before he gets it to the top, it rolls right back down the hill. That's Flanders Mansion. You go back 35, maybe more years. It's been, and longer than that, our property. And so I want to relate it to a successful project you've had in Carmel because it entailed the city government and the citizens. And the citizens got together and solved the problem. You're sitting in the building that, that accomplished. It was done with citizen help. And there's a group of people that are, get, are sitting now trying to figure out how we could get the Flanders Mansion either and brought up the code and someone living there and having very small, such as uh, activities in one of the rooms or two, um, small photography lessons, artists learning how to paint, those kinds of things, a book club, small groups. We had a great meeting with the, the residents and frankly, I was surprised the number that turned out. That was really very well done. So we're just starting to reach out. So here we are. We got a committee of citizens in the, from the area that are interested in helping the city solve a problem you've had and never been able to solve. 
to this date. So what they're looking for, I think, is cooperation from the city, recognition that if we work together, if you work together, you might just be able to solve that problem and keep that damn boulder at the top of the hill. Hey, is there anybody else wishing to speak? Hi. Uh, Jeff, members of the city council. Um, my name is Gerard Rose. Um, one of the recurring problems in Carmel by the sea is that we have an asset that is one of the most beautiful in the entire entirety of uh, Monterey County, but very few people know about it, and that's Mission Trails Park. Karen Ferlito knows all about it because she lives very close, but it's one of those things that most tourists never find their way to to explore or to enjoy. Excuse me, I'm losing my breath. Um, when Mayor White was the mayor of Carmel by the sea, there were at least two proposals to rescue the Mission Trails Park, which was falling into some disorder. And there were also at least two proposals to save the Flanders Mansion, which was badly deteriorating and still is. I was on the city council for 10 years and uh, we had at least one proposal to do something with Flanders Mansion, but it came to nothing. Basically, there are three different kinds of proposals to do something about Flanders Mansion. One of the proposals was just to sell it outright. And that, that idea has been floated a number of times and the residents of Carmel by the Sea have made it clear that selling the mansion outright does not work. Another proposal was to make it a home for artists or even public employees. And that, that proposal never worked out either. So now, 25 years of more deterioration since I was on the council and Mayor White was on the council, somebody finally came up with a plan a program that might be able to make a difference. And basically what that plan was, was to bring in the citizens of Carmel by the Sea and have them meet with uh, Mayor White and me and see if we couldn't come up with a program that would keep the residents who not only who live in Carmel by the Sea, but in some of the uh, residents who live outside what is technically the city, but close to the Flanders Mansion, and see if we couldn't make something beautiful out of Mission Trails Park in the area of the Flanders Mansion. So Mayor White and I have conferred with various people, including Mike Buffo, who's in the back there with the, with the uh, folders, and we have an idea that maybe we can make Flanders Mansion useful. I'm a historical buff. That's why I bought all of Alessandra's books. Um, but the most important thing is to get the people who live near the Flanders Mansion on board. So before we did anything specific, we talked to them. We called them in. We had meetings with them, and, and now that we've spoken to the neighbors, we think we know what people do want and what they don't want. And what they do want is for us to talk to the city about saving the mansion, restoring it. We've got a wasting asset that needs to be rescued, and that's what I propose. So, we have specifics, that's what, that's what those green binders are all about. We have specifics in mind, and what I'd like you to do is take a look at our proposals and to give us your thoughts, because you are the guardians of the city, you are the guardians of our properties, and you are the people who can save this wasting asset 
and turn it into something that's a, a, a gift for not only the residents of Carmel, but for other people who like to walk through our properties and especially through Mission Trails Park. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, Ken. Um, City Council, Mayor, Chip, staff. I have been dreaming about what I'm going to say most mornings right now. And I'm going to angle this a little bit better. I'm recording this for our website, carmeloutlands.org, and for our newsletter, The Outlands Journal, and for the announcements that we are going to start making. Uh, what this is, this plan, has been workshopped. Every two weeks, we've been meeting in Ken's living room, this committee, the Flanders Mansion Restoration Committee. And we formed a nonprofit organization called the Carmel Outlands, named after the historic home of the facility, the Outlands and the 80 Acres. It's really exciting. And this is such a relief to me to, to print these. I have one for, I have seven copies, and I'll give them out in a minute. Um, and I'm going to set this down. Uh, one of my board members the other day told me, Mike, this is long, but concise. I don't know if, what that, if that makes sense to you, but you've done a hell of a job here. Uh, the committee has inputted, has uh, reviewed every word of this. Uh, this plan, just to, just to sum it up, it's, it's comprehensive, yet it's flexible. It meets the needs of the, of, the, of the residents. They want it to be a home, so it will be primarily a family home. But the public wants there to be a public benefit. The city wants to leverage it somehow. And so this is why my little spark of an idea has, 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 has become this, this flame, is because we have the technology now. We can have private events, have some people on site, but have the majority of our attendees come in remotely online with remote attendance. And so our events in the great room will have a great capacity to do that. And maybe one day we can do this, this meeting there or other types of facility meetings there. So small groups, city groups, also causes that we believe in. All of us are a part of so many different causes, but we could use this facility to do that. We can leverage it and get it, get it humming again. So uh, to do that, we've got to tell a story of why. Why is it important to do this? So as a visual storyteller, I'm committed to continuing to tell the story. And the, the story is really working through me. And that's my pledge is to continue to be the, the champion of this. Uh, and what I've realized is that this, this is way bigger than me. Uh, this plan is not about me. It's about the committee. And it's about a nonprofit organization of devoted people to restore and maintain it and put it to good work. So uh, I just want to just emphasize that all we need is a small sign of enthusiasm from the city. Our donors can't pledge without having the city's full support. So we're asking you to work with us to, to establish a special purpose fund at the Community Foundation. And that's the final document here, it's the final appendix. And there's two signatures from Mayor, Mayor Potter and, and his city administrator, Chip Rarig. So we invite you to work with us to the Flanders Ad Hoc Committee to meet with us and let's let's look at this. Let's let's go through it and come up with a um, any terms that need to be adjusted. Um, I think you'll find it's 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 comprehensive and it's ready. It's ready to be workshopped. And is there anything else that I'm leaving out? <laughs> it, it's 50 pages of just the master plan. There's the design guide. There's two forwards. So if you only have time to read the first two pages, there's the two page summary right in the beginning. Um, but if you do have time, I think I think you'll I think you'll enjoy it. Each chapter begins with some poetry inspired by Karma by the Sea's romantic history, and it's been a lot of love. And I give it to you, and I hope we can meet soon. I'm going to pass it pass it to you. I'm going to pass this out. Questions? Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Does anybody else wish Thank to speak you. today? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Greg D'Ambrosio. Um, good afternoon. I'm Greg D'Ambrosio, Vice Chair of uh, the Friends of Mission Trail Park, 
uh, preserve, uh, more commonly known as uh, friends or the Wheaties. And I started as forester uh, for Carmel by the Sea, conceiving of and building most of the parks and trails in Carmel more than 50 years ago and was one of the first people to walk into Flanders when, when the city first purchased us. Um, <clears throat> from the moment I started creating Mission Trail Nature Preserve, I was, I've considered Flanders and the Leicester Roundtree Garden essential elements of the preserve. Today I'm here to present a proposal to annex Flanders into the Mission Trail Nature Preserve and restore its historic significance. Friends is an all-volunteer 501c3 that has been working diligently for 15 years to restore and protect the Mission Trail Nature Preserve, which some people would like to call Carmel's uh, Central Park. Um, we have long, a long and successful track record improving the preserve and including removing invasives, greatly reducing fire fuels, improving the walking trails and chipping them all. Uh, and we've planted scores of native trees. We have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to accomplish these efforts, and we have forged an excellent partnership with the city throughout the years. Uh, here are some of the key takeaway points regarding our proposal to making Flanders an integral part of Mission Trail. Friends would secure a long-term lease with the city to ensure that we were responsible for all the efforts. This would alleviate city's burden and open the uh, opportunity for local funding to be fully uh, tax exempt, tax deductible. Friends would be responsible for the uh, Flanders restoration with a highly reputable historic building architect. Our proposal requires no changes to existing parking. Everything would stay as it is, has always been. This is a very important uh, component to uh, the Hatton neighbors and to our efforts to protect the integrity of the preserve. A change in parking would require that new trails be implemented, which can further disturb damages uh, and damage the preserve's natural ecosystems. No fencing will be implemented around the Flanders. If another proposal is considered or if Flanders were to be sold, inevitably a fence would be implemented and pri uh, for privacy or functionality. Any fencing will force uh, preserve walkers to regularly park in the Flanders driveway uh, to park up at Hatton Road and then walk down to the trails uh, that do not currently exist uh, to access the preserve. Also, fence, a fence would uh, cut off the Lester Roundtree uh, Native Plant Garden from the Mission Trail Nature Reserve. My fellow board member, Laura Bowling, will now speak about the Conservation Fellowship and caretaking program that we envision as a key component of the proposal. We look forward to meeting with each and every council member to explain and discuss our proposal in, a more, in more detail. Thank you for our consideration. Thank you, Greg. Next speaker. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm Laura Bowling. I'm a proud board member of the Friends of Mission Trail Nature Reserve. I moved to Carmel six years ago from Washington, DC. Um, I've been in the uh, environmental conservation space for about 15 years. So once I settled in, I knew I wanted to volunteer and uh, give back to the community. So in 2018, uh, December of 2018, I submitted this proposal called Outlands for Carmel, um, which like Mike said, I took from the original uh, ground name where Flanders had been established heavy. I came in third for this RFP, but what that did was open the door for me to meet a lot of new neighbors. First among them was an esteemed lawyer and fourth generation Carmelite, Skip Lloyd. Skip invited me to join the Wheaties Brigade, and that's what I did. So for the past five years, I pulled invasives, I've scrubbed up fire, you know, fire fuel and helped the team plant um, new plants. And what I've learned is that Flanders is inextricable it, from the Mission Trail Nature Preserve. They are truly linked. Um, over the course of time, I also learned that best practices for land trusts um, are the idea that you never want to create an in-holding. You don't want to have any kind of separate island 
um, created on a public land space. Um, that kind of thing can interrupt wildlife and habitat safety, and it's also costly and difficult to maintain. We think it's time for a fresh proposal. We think solving Flanders, uh, the Flanders puzzle um, comes down to taking the example that all of us have seen in national parks, states, city parks, um, all across the country. And what they've done is they've entrusted this kind of effort to local supporters, particularly local supporters with a, true, uh, a proven track record like the Friends of Mission Trail Nature Preserve. Friends is an established 15 years running 501c3. We've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for the preserve. We've put in tens of thousands, probably more um, volunteer sweat equity hours to restoring, cleaning, and preserving um, the Mission Trail. We facilitated a comprehensive biological research project and assessment, which has absolutely guided meticulous work in terms of what we've done conservation wise since 2016. As Greg mentioned, we've transformed the beauty and the accessibility of the Mission Trail. It's groomed, the trails are chipped. And what I love most about it is that we've created in an, you know, just serene, beautiful environment for our neighbors to really enjoy. And lastly, we formed a really good partnership with the city of Carmel by the Sea, a collaborative, long-standing working relationship. With this strong track record, we think that Friends is uniquely positioned um, you know, to take Flanders on. It's listed on the National Trust for Historic Preservation and to safeguard the Misha Trail and the Lester Roundtree Garden. Under our proposal, Friends would secure a long-term lease with the city and establish the Friends Conservation Caretaker Fellowship. The fellowship would have two distinct phases. The first phase of the fellowship would identify an, indiv an individual to help lead the professional restoration of Flanders, beautify the adjacent landscaping, and actively contribute to the daily care and maintenance of Flanders and the Mission Trail. The second phase of the fellowship would establish a standardized process which friends would oversee for selecting future caretakers who will live on the premises for a set period of time and we would provide opportunities for professionals in the field of forestry, wildlife conservation, and climacology to assist in the continuing protection of the preserve. I really need a glass of water. Um, pardon me. Our friend's proposal has, thank you, um, Marco Rubio. Huh? Our friend's proposal has multiple benefits for the community. It will benefit the immediate neighbors living on Hatton and adjacent to the Mission Trail. Flanders Mansion would be a low impact residence. It would require no new fencing. It would not have any kind of public access facility and there would be no need to change any of the parking, which is something that's really important to those neighbors. It would benefit our broader Carmel, air, uh, Carmel community by opening up the experience of caring for Flanders Mansion to many people. And this is a really key thing. We think that this is um, both the preserve and Flanders is an opportunity to bring the creativity and vitality of multiple people to bear through this fellowship program. It restores a deteriorating, uh, deteriorating city asset and creates a dedicated steward for the park, which will help create a strong, seamless connection to the Bridge to Everywhere project as it progresses. And lastly, we think it benefits you, the city. This takes a huge burden off your busy plates. It puts the responsibility in friends' hands to manage and to fundraise for all of these efforts. We are convinced that if we don't, um, uh, we're convinced that any other arrangement risks permanent disconnection between the Mission Trail and Flanders. We would welcome 
opportunity to go into further detail, share a proposal with you, and talk through any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> Is there anybody else wishing to speak today? Last call. Anybody else? I'm not seeing anybody. Okay. Um, well, so we certainly thank um, the speakers. I, I think that that the fact that we have at least two interested parties is indicative of the fact that um, a, in a, a much more iterative process, like the council went through a couple of years ago, to find someone to steward, curate, occupy the resource um, would be in order. Um, the, the, the question comes down to whether you would like us to spend capacity on that now in the next six months, or whether this can wait until we get some other things, higher priority items off our list and address it in, um, in, in September. Council members, questions, thoughts? I, I, I appreciate uh, both uh, groups that spoke and thank you for the time and effort you've put into this and, and you clearly care and, and this is gonna be a big decision, um, but Chip, I know what you're saying as well is that uh, it's always comes to a matter of staff capacity and priority right now. Um, unfortunately, we have so many other things going on that I don't see keeping it as a high priority, but something that um, we can maybe push back a little bit, but also, um, you know, soon address, but maybe just not quite now. Council members. My, my thought is that um, we do have two proposals that are interesting to look at. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I do think we have to feel and try to give them some credibility. So I'm not sure what we should do as far as going ahead and saying priority higher or low. But I do want to make sure that we don't miss this opportunity. So maybe a way of, of including that out, Mayor, is, is mm -hmm. you know, maybe Brandon and I or whatever, someone and I talk to the two applicants and say, does it kill your proposal to wait until September or is it, is, you know, is it imperative that we do it now? Um, and then come back to you. Committee. I think which consists of count. I, I, I apologize. So every, for everyone's benefit, there is an ad hoc committee of Council Member Dramoff and Mayor Potter that are working, you know, are assigned to this project. I apologize, Mayor. When, can I ask, Mayor, when do you, when does the ad hoc committee, when do you think you could come to us with something? I don't know. That's a good question, Alessandra. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even met yet, to be honest with everyone. So <laughs> I'm not sure. We do have a lot going on, and then budget season comes around June. So um, I would say it would probably have to be after that, Mr. Mayor, if that sounds OK. July or August, could we have a meeting then? But that's feasible. Pardon me? Yeah. So let's, get, let's say the ad hoc will meet with staff in July or August to go ahead and come up with it once we get through this budget cycle. Okay, yeah, perfect. Um, so let's entertain these two options and see what else is out there. Okay. See what the process would look like. Okay. Would you, I, I guess my question, sorry. My question would be, do we as council members have the go ahead to talk to the applicants on our own? Like, would there be objection to, should we just be quiet? Or become, like, you know, kind of curious. I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. Would, would Brown Act restrict? Would be a serial, would that be a yeah. serial meeting or something? Brian's out there. It, it wouldn't be a serial meeting. You, you have to disclose that you met with the applicants when it comes to decision making time. But you obviously, I would never recommend that you share your feelings about a proposal sure. or proposals with any anyone, uh, uh, any applicant or fellow members of the council. Brian, council. Yeah, I think Brian has. Uh, Work something up. up about this, Brian. Well, I, I would just add that what, what what Chip just said is accurate under the Brown Act. Thank you. Appreciate that input. All right, so we can we can go ahead. Yeah, I guess my you know he the, the city attorney said that what what I he he agreed with me. Yeah. Believe it or not, um, so was, yeah, what I said was accurate. So that's what the the city attorney said. We talked a little bit, you know, a couple of hours ago when we were talking, well, I spoke a little bit a couple of hours ago when I was talking about the design traditions project about sort of projects losing momentum and, you know, sort of falling apart. And it seems like both of these proposals have, you know, both of them um, seem to have put some thought into them and, and maybe a way, you know, for me as a council member to sort of keep the momentum at least alive, if not, would be to just chit chat. Um, so that's my thinking, not in terms of just reading the proposals and, you know, providing feedback to them, you know, things that I see as red flags. I mean, you know, the, the, the proposals are, are pretty different. Mm -hmm. um, I think also that 
it's it's hard to imagine how this is really going to work. I mean, last time we had a last time we had a, an RFP process with a number of applicants. You know, we set aside some standards and. And I would also really like, you know, this time to see that sort of happen top down like it did last time. So it's hard to reconcile that with the proposals that we already have. And so I'd like to just be a little more comfortable with it. All right, with well, respect to that, I think that makes sense. So we go ahead and continue this till July or August for a public input allow the opponents to speak to council members in the meantime. Yes, sir. Yeah, and I would say that <clears throat> one of the components of moving towards either proposal or even a third one if it would come up would be we need to know what happened in the past with regard to Flanders Foundation's lawsuit, what was determined by the uh, vote of the public. We need to know all those things because we need to know if either or both of these proposals fit within the parameters of those previous decisions and how they would impact um, testimony that came out of those decisions regarding parking, public access, yeah. events, and so on. Because we can't really evaluate either proposal until we know the facts of what we have to have that designed around. Yes, I think that was really a great cue. Um, so Emily went to law school and she's reviewed both superior court decision, the council's actions to actually withdraw approval of their CEQA document, their environmental document, Mr. Pyrrhic has as well. So um, they're familiar with the, you know, the, the kind of the legal history and the settlement agreement, which is most important with the Flanders, uh, Flanders, Flanders Foundation. So yeah, we can, we'll, we'll, we can put that in a synopsis for you as well. Yes, and when and if it does come back, um, we need a field trip there as a council mm -hmm. together so that we see the actual conditions. I happened to take a little walk through the other day when I caught Cleve up there doing some maintenance. And it's not as bad as it's made out to be. No. It's really not. So Yeah, and we offer, you know, I, I have a key. So if anybody ever wants to go there, call me and pick me up and we can go up. Council member, a lot of the council members and I have been there. We can do that during uh, the same time we do the bridge walk. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The bridge can I walk, add, yeah. if this is coming back, because I don't want it to lose steam while we have two interested parties. So if if we do have an hour, we do have an ad hoc, can you explain maybe to me and the public what that ad hoc is going to look like? Is it going to be two council members, five members of the public, all of the public? You know what I mean? Like when 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 can we say there'll be a first meeting? Of this ad hoc committee. Not until October, not, not until July. Yeah, after, after, I think what the mayor and Councilmember Dramoff, who are the ad hoc committee, are saying is after we get through a budget adoption, so looking at about, I'm looking to both of you, to August, and then, you know, traditionally what, what we have done with some ad hocs is we meet kind of internally with the project team and then open it up to members of the public for information. But it, you know, there's no, there's no rules regarding uh, mm -hmm. those kinds of things, so that's what I would imagine we would do. Um, and again, we've got a we've got a rich history um, of, uh, and the most current history about the failed conservatorship. Um, a lot of lessons learned, and several of you were council members when when uh, we did that that episode. All right, do we have direction then? Yes, sir. Okay, we have six more items to go. We are, we were advertised to go from ten to two. Now after two, is the council willing to go? Finish up this agenda. Okay, we're going to go ahead. We'll continue on. Yeah, and so what, what we can do is instead of doing the um, the matrix at the end, maybe what we do, looking to you, to you ladies, maybe we bring the matrix back, you know, based on what we've, we've heard, and then the council can tinker with that so we don't have to take any more time after we... So we've gotten some thumbs up and thumbs downs here. Uh, undergrounding power lines, Mr. Barron spoke to this. I mean, we're using the, the Rule 20A, which is undergrounding as a litmus test and uh, experiment, toe in the water, sand, whatever it's called. And so, um, uh, you know, my, my suggestion here is to leave it on your list because the, the Rule 20A undergrounding is going to help inform the veracity of a citywide undergrounding. And again, I'll look to Councilmember Dramoff and Councilmember Barron to just, if you, if you agree with me. I'm, I'm fine with that. I just want to 
kind of just hint to the public that we're talking about something that's an extreme amount of money. And, and as Jeff mentioned earlier, uh, this uh, Rule 20 group that we're working on will sort of be a, a, a test case of if this is something that's feasible. But I just don't want the public to have unrealistic expectations that this is something that can be done citywide or that can be done quickly. Um, so we're, we're still going to be in the fact-finding mode through our work with the PG&E committee, and that will provide us a lot more information that we can share with the public about the reality of whether this is something that can be done, or as in previous years, that it's been decided that this really cannot be done. It's not feasible. Um, I would like to know the date certain by when we have to make the decision about protecting the money. Yes, ma'am. That, well, that's December 31st of this year. That's not this priority. That was an earlier one for the Rule 20A. Um, and, and Mr. Toomey wrote, um, so there, there are two distinct priorities. So the Rule 20A, because we have funding from PG&E, which we're, we, we could lose if we don't establish a district and do some things. This is citywide, not using Rule 20A funding, using some other funding source like the lottery. <laughs> or, or something, so. Um, so yeah, I got it. Yeah, I if if that's good, we'll keep it on the I list. And the public and, input on this one. Oh, I'm sorry. The public want to speak to this item. Hello, I'd like to uh, bring you up to speed on the last line there. Carmel Cares working with residents. Uh, I'm happy to say that we turned in our preliminary design, which was developed by Wallace Group, same engineering company the city's been working with. The city's been very much involved with this project. I'm keeping everybody up to speed. And uh, the city's been very great to work with on this project. Uh, so we turned in our preliminary design to PG&E a couple days ago. I personally think that they're gonna move very quickly. They love the business model we've developed, which which I won't go into detail, but it's pretty exciting and they've never seen before. Um, they are hopefully going to turn around their design in three months or quicker. And once we have that, we are going to be doing the joint trench design with the utilities and PG&E in the meantime. And uh, we will hire a contractor and we'll do the project. So this really could happen within a year. Brandon's smiling at me, but uh, they, in the meantime, they've been turning other opportunities from here all the way down to Yankee Point over to Carmel Cares and this business model, which is interesting because they see this as a way forward to free them up from doing all the upfront situations where only 20% of them ever happen. So that's part of the problem. I think they're wasting their time. So it, it takes six months for a phone call, but we answer the phone right away. So one of the projects is up on Lincoln between first and second, another one on on scenic between ocean and eighth another one on martin or on bayview to the west side of martin way and another one from point lobos all the way to yankee point on highway one all of these projects have people with a fair amount of resources to do so and they can do that with tax free or tax deferred money and which lowers the price about 40 percent for those people anyway that's my update thank you Thank you, Dale. Appreciate that. Anybody else? All right, bring it back. Yeah, we clear. Okay, do I We're good. Uh, the next, the next item, which we added in October, is is extremely time sensitive. Uh, um, Andy Carr talked about, you know, having a, you know, making sure everyone's well informed, and, and uh, clearly, I and mean, we should have started the conversation with. We want to make sure the community, whether it's residents, commercial property owners, business owners, what have you feel like we're doing something for them rather than to them. So the reason I tell you this is time sensitive is because if we're to proceed with a ballot measure for an even year election, which is this year, um, to add a, a transit occupancy tax increase in November, we need to begin socialize that now. I wish we had done it a little bit sooner. We have to get the ballot language in by August. I mean, technically July. Or July, August. There it is, July. So again, we don't want the hospitality community to feel like they didn't hear about this and just add a TOT increase. So um, if you're going to keep it on, because it could be a significant revenue source, uh, um, we did math in public yesterday. Uh, Nova did math, and we're looking at a 2% TOT, a TOT increase. It brings an additional 
1.4 million. 1.4 million dollars per year could be used any way you want. Obviously, it's a policy decision. Um, just for information, most other communities in our area, are, uh, their, tier, their transit occupancy tax is 12 percent, uh, with the exception of the county. Um, we are at 10 percent, but we do have 2 percent self-assessed by hospitality for Visit Carmel. So the de facto rate is is 12 percent. So. Again, if we're going to get going on this one, we probably need to begin to socialize it within the, you know, by May or at the May meeting. Could I um, sort of ask a question, kind of, it's kind of a question comment. Uh, if I understand correctly, if it's going to be for the general fund, there's a lower percentage that the public has to um, vote to approve it. And then if it's going to be given to a specific fund, it has to be a higher, I believe, two thirds. Do we know, are we talking about general right now or are we talking about a specific use? I, that's that's a question for you. But so Proposition 218 um, says that um, uh, if you're going to raise, if you're going to tax, if it's for, it, it's it's kind of it's it's actually backwards. It's ridiculous. So if you're going to use it for general purposes, the passage rate is 50% one plus one. So that means you could pay me more, or you could buy a police car or whatever. If it's for a specific purpose like, uh, I don't know, like a new police department remodel, um, that it has to pass by 66 and, 66 and two thirds, so 66%. So it's a higher threshold for a specific purpose. So we would need to decide that and declare that before we can put this on the ballot? Yes. As a council? Y yes. Yes. I mean, again, just because you have a general tax doesn't mean you can't spend it any way you want. That's okay. a policy issue, but if you're going to you know, do so. So the existing sales tax, Measure C, um, which is uh, which, which we adopted a few years ago now, that's a general tax. So we can use it for any purpose we want. Is there anybody in the public who should speak to this item? Yeah, I don't see anybody. All righty, get back to council. I don't have a problem having a discussion about this. Anybody else? Dave, I couldn't understand. I, said I don't have a problem having a discussion about this. No, I'd like to have a discussion about it because I'm scared to death about our <laughs> budget and our CIP and all the things that we need to get done. And um, I think it's it's something we need to explore quickly. What you said if if it's in an even year, can it be in an off year? No, no. it has to be general election. A general election, which would be every two years. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion by council members? May sounds good to me. Okay. Okay. Thank you, council. Right. So we'll see it. Just to be clear, we'll see it in May. Like, we'll follow sort of the same process we followed back in 20, 2019. 2020. Or, 2020. 2020. So even year. 2020. But that would have been COVID. The COVID year. We it did was, it before. Uh, no, Measure C was in 2020. What? Measure C was in 2020. It's a special. Yeah, I, yes. I think that one started to be discussed in 2019. So it was discussed for longer before it was put on the ballot. It was in the ballot in 2020, though, yeah. In the spring of 2020. Um, oh, during the uh, this primary season. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Carr has a question. If you Sorry, like. question? Yes, ma'am. So, yeah, we're. What was it raised from? What was it and what was it raised to? It wasn't a tax raise, it was uh, C. It, was a, it, was, a, it was a new tax. Yeah, so our sales tax went from our special sales tax, which is a city, we keep all of it, right. went from one and a half. No, well, I'm referring to the TOT tax for public health. It's, it's, never, it's never been raised. Yes. Not. I, I don't have an opinion at this point in time, but but um, it's been 10 percent for decades. Okay, yeah. When I owned hotels, it was at 10 percent. Um, yeah. So what Mrs. Carr is saying when she owned hotels, it was 10 percent. <laughs> so we have one vote right there. So, uh, okay, right. so yeah, moving moving along, Mr. Mayor. Yep, let's move on. Uh, the Bridge to Everywhere, this is a COD project. I know Mayor White's here. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're real strong advocates of this project. We wrote a letter to the Coastal Conservancy. Congressman Farr, you know, 
Greg, Mayor White, you know, the whole, Doug Schmitz, a whole party, Barbara Bukema, who's the, gen, the executive director for COD, we're very supportive. Mayor's on a subcommittee. We recently assigned Catherine Wallace, who's a brilliant young planner that we have from the planning office. So uh, this is, a, we're, we're kind of in a support role. I, I don't, again, based on the hour, I don't know if you need to discuss it a lot. It needs to remain, it's a great project. What it would basically do is look at a landing zone using Rio Park, which is a property that we've owned since 1986, um, as uh, the, the end of a bridge, a pedestrian bridge, that would link up a series of trails, not just in Mission Trail Nature Preserve, but you could traverse all the way out along the river to Rancho Cañada and maybe Garland. So um, it's a great project. We should remain a support role. It uh, doesn't have a, it was a priority items, but we'll, we'll continue to work on this. Again, we're in a support role. Anybody wish to speak to this? Yeah. I tried. <laughs> and this is a, a project that uh, had its roots uh, about 50 years ago when I started building Mission Trail Nature Preserve and thought it'd be wonderful to have that as a link to the greater community. And then I happened to uh, get appointed to the uh, COD, the Sanitary District. And the day I first started the meeting, uh, my first meeting, they were thinking about eliminating the catwalk bridge across Carmel River. And they were just about to make the point, and I wasn't, I was there to listen, but not be involved because I hadn't seen the, the agenda. But when it came up, I said, well, wait a minute, don't get rid of the bridge, you'll never get it back. And it could be an asset for a link to the south side of the Carmel River from Mission Trail Nature Preserve. And to this day, I've been pushing that as long as I could possibly do it and I've gotten winded doing it. But we're pretty close to uh, working uh, a deal out and we're sort of thinking that it's gonna be a description of Hatton to the Pacific Greenway. And that would include Mission Trail, uh, Rio Park, uh, the bridge that Cod owns, and they're fully in support of it, as well as uh, hopefully the city so and the community at large, because it'll be a great connection for everybody to be able to walk on foot across the Carmel River and link into uh, all the regional parks, as well as Point Lobos. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Is there anybody else? Oh, like they say, when you get old, you got to keep busy. Um, COD is uh, the organizing uh, group that's taking this project on. And basically, it's a hiking trail, not a walking trail, but it could be used for both. The hiking trail would start at the base of Ocean Avenue, go along the beach on your pathway, our pathway, around the point, down along by uh, the uh, Eastwoods. What, what the devil would call that place? Yeah, Mission Ranch. Mission Ranch, and then we have a right of way, Cod does, across the old stables of this flatland we used was going to be a park. The city's using that for their purposes. The bridge that uh, Greg's talking about is a 70 year old suspension bridge, very much like the Golden Gate. Looks a little different than the Golden Gate, but it's just the same big cables. Well, the base piers are cracking, cement's cracking, and starting to go. go. It's the only way across the river if the bridge goes out again, which we hope it doesn't. But the trail would go across the bridge down and under Highway 1, which you see they're starting to talk about a causeway under the road there, uh, close to the existing Highway 1 bridge. Or if you want to start across behind the youth baseball field, the south side, we have a right of way across to a mission uh, across Bishop Fields area and going up the park. And so you've got a great selection of distances to walk. You go up the park, cut to the ocean side to the left at the end of it, and you have to walk down through our business district to get to your car, which is probably parked at the foot of ocean. So that's a positive too. They're gonna to be tired, they wanna stop and have you know something to eat or look. Okay, so that's what we're, we're pushing on, and we're looking for cooperation, and so far it's been very helpful from the city, 
to put this package together. We're footing the initial amount of money out of our budget because it's important to us. If there's ever a flood and we have a problem with the bridge, the highway bridge, the one that's there now is the only way we can get to the sewage treatment plant. And so it helps us too, and that's where we're fully behind it. Coastal Conservancy, Greg mentioned, is very positive about it, except apparently the state budget is not positive as it should be, but we're fairly high up in their, their choice. And don't ever forget our fight song. When you flush, think of us. Just be quick. I didn't have a chance to set up technology wise, but I am helping Ken and Greg and Sam Farr and Barbara Bukima and others work on the Bridge to Everywhere project. We're almost ready to launch our new website. And so I'll make sure that everyone gets a chance uh, to see it. But we want this to be something that the public um, loves and can see and understand because it's all of our most spectacular beauty places. We want to create the most incredible walking and hiking trail um, in the state of California. And so I just wanted to let you know that very soon you'll be able to see what we're uh, putting together. Thank, Thank you, Laura. You. Anybody else wishing to speak? You know, when I bring it back, I think this is a great project. I'd make it a high priority. I really do. I think it's got a great potential for connecting all the way all the systems, all the, all the resources we've got from Nature Preserve, Mission Trail, all the way out to Point Lobos. Amazing project. I would leave it. Agree, Mayor, leave it as high. Yeah, I think the wonderful thing about it is in all these years where we have not been able to actually create the real park we all want, this would actually almost do this with, well, it would do it without any purchase of land. It would do it with uh, full cooperation from state parks, Coastal Conservancy, Regional Park District, uh, the COD. It's, it's just a, a wonderful project that would make a special place. Joyce Stevens used to say that Carmel was lucky that it was surrounded by an emerald necklace. Joyce Stevens is in her 90s and she did a lot of preservation work. That would be Hatton Canyon, Mission Trail, uh, the river, the beach and Pescadero. And this would allow people to have the enjoyment of that riparian area when, when uh, the uh, scenic pathway or, uh, excuse me, the beach was not available. It, sh it just provides some wonderful opportunity. So I think we should definitely keep it on a high priority. I just wanted to thank everyone who's been working on it um, and the effort and the passion you put in and it just really shows what amazing people we have in this community and when they come together and the thoughts and the creativity that they have so thank you all okay we have direction this one's kind of a third rail i mean we 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 do have the north lot oh so just just to confirm so when we drafted the lease with sunset cultural center inc the nonprofit that manages this property for us, we specifically excluded the north lot from the lease. So, just just want to really kind of make that clear. And that you know, we drafted that in 2017. Um, Christine Sandin on Sunset side, me on our side with a couple of council members. So, you know, th th there was some ideas here. That we also got an unsolicited proposal um, from a major developer, which was again, not solicited by us. Um, this property is identified as a, an opportunity site in the draft housing element. Provides us there's no obligation to do anything on it with the exception of sending out an RFP with all kinds of conditions uh, that, that we would socialize obviously with council and with stakeholders. But um, yeah, this one is, is this one's pretty tricky. So it is a low priority. I certainly wouldn't recommend that you elevate it anything to anything higher than it currently is. All right, is there anybody in the public wishing to speak to this item? Hi, Tim Toomey again. Um, I recommend that you delete this. As Chip pointed out, it's uh, already included in the um, housing element uh, project. And to keep these, keep this as well as the opportunities in the housing element project on um, a priority list is just too confusing. So that would be my recommendation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Is there anybody else? We hand her the mic. 
Question, Mary Gifford, um, you're going to build underground parking when you, if and when you do this, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. If you, do, in the meantime, while you're constructing, which is probably the two-year project, where are all these cars going to park? Where? So, Mrs. where Gifford's will all the asking, cars park that are right out there in the north lot? If let's say the project takes two years, neighborhood. Well, drive by this neighborhood in the next week and you'll see with all the construction that's going on, there are no parking places. Yeah, so, so to Mrs. Griffith's question again, there's, there's no project planned at this point in time. Um, so, um, but what, what the council is requiring for large scale projects is what's called a construction truck parking management plan. So again, that's for private development. We would certainly do it for ourselves, but again, that's a long way down the road. And I just, you know, uh, Mayor McLeod is here. So Mayor McLeod and I met with Clint Eastwood 25 years ago, and what was that guy's name? Steve Diamond, who was the one to build an art gallery, public art gallery. There was a proposed expansion of, well, we wanted to rebuild the library there. Part, Thodos was the architect. Yeah, so there are a lot of ideas. And I think that, that that's been percolating, but again, nothing's happened. But there's um, no water. There's no water, there's no parking, no trees. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. That was my second question. So you answered it. No water. How do you move people in with no water? Yeah, well, yeah, you'll, lot, you'll come lot, to it. So it's lot, still on the lot, back, back burner. Well, that's why we're recommending. It's already on the back burner, so okay. the council is going to debate Thank whether you. to take it off the burner altogether. All right, anybody else wishing to speak? Anybody who would bring back to council? Council members? I would agree with Tim. I, I think it is confusing, and I think we—I think we can delete it off of our list. Okay. Thank you, Council. All right. Next item. Uh, housing element implementation. Again, it's—it's. It's, it was added as a priority item because it's—it's it's a necessity out of the the housing element. There's no real action that we can can take now because the element hasn't been adopted. So. Um, I just leave it on and it'll it'll percolate along. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say it's more than five percent though? The implementation. Yes, yeah, so oh. I think I think the thing yeah the thing to draw between is the other item is the adoption of the housing element and once the housing element is adopted then we start the implementation. So the only part of the implementation that's done is really the creation of the uh, implementation schedule. So we know it's what we were going to try to do over the next eight years. So until we start that eight years, it really hasn't started. Only the creation of the schedule has happened yet. Thank you. I have a thought on account of the heading if it is what it is, but is there anybody in the public wishing to speak to this item? Really quickly, I think the housing element has got a lot of projects and programs uh, in it as a part of that timeline rollout, and I question whether or not we've got adequate staff to take that on. So would like to make sure we can be successful at whatever we choose to implement. Uh, but there are uh, directions and commitments in that that uh, is going to need potentially more resource, because I know those resources just grow on trees around here. But <laughs> just wanted to mention. Thank you. Thank you. I just didn't ask anybody you. else. Don't see anybody. Councilman Dramoff, I don't. Yep. If there's no one else from the public, just an asterisk to what Nancy said is, especially with the low income housing, you're going to have to have some staff member, somebody keeping track of the people's income, whether they are staying at that income level and that sort of thing. So that will take staff time. Well, actually, uh, that's that's something to be debated, because if if and when we would engage uh, with developing, say, the north lot we would probably if we were wise engage with an experienced affordable housing developer who would do the management of that because that is a very big job and there are people that know how to do it and uh, could have that just like the foundation manages the income limits and who gets to live at the foundation and so on and so forth. There are people that are professionals at that and affordable housing developers usually have that expertise. I did want to mention that housing element implementation, one of the very first things will be the development of the objective design guidelines, which we have money for. It was mentioned earlier that we've spent all this money on the study 
but that money came from the state, the money to do the uh, project or the, the plan with HCD, that money came from the state in the form of a LEAP grant to do that. And there is money from the state, it did get cut a little bit, but there is money from the state to do the next uh, phase, which I believe we're gonna use for development of the objective design guidelines. So yes, it did take our staff time, but there were several hundred thousand dollars in that grant. Brandon could uh, speak to that. But it seems this is a logical place to the thing that we just took off maybe be part of this uh, because once we have that uh, approved plan, the certified plan, which we hope we will have very, very shortly, then we can actually start uh, more outreach to see the uh, property owners in the downtown area, for example, what their interest is, what we could offer them as far as the little tiny bit of water we have. We have to remember that sometime in this eight year period, we hope there will be a water solution. So um, yeah, there's a lot to now the next phases once we have our certification. All right, so where are we going with this? What do you want to do? Well, I think it has to stay as a priority because if we don't do some of that implement, implementation and outreach and we get a um, sort of a report card halfway through our cycle, they're gonna wonder why we haven't done some of the implementation as I understand it. Is that yep, correct, hopefully, Brandon? Hopefully by September, we will have an adopted housing element. We can discuss its priority ranking again then, but for now it just stays in this kind of this purgatory limbo um as a low priority yeah, okay coherence. thank Still you council. final item final item um we had a we have an ad hoc committee on outdoor wine tasting this is on private property not in the public right away not on our sidewalks certainly not in our parks or natural areas uh the ad hoc committee is made up of mayor potter and and um council member richards i'm, I'm sorry baron um i was looking at him but i, I don't know what happened but um Brandon and I attended a meeting. It was really a well-attended meeting, members of the public, members of the, the wine industry, if you will, wine tasting rooms and the like. And uh, I think the, the ad hoc committee really communicated what they felt would be comfortable with. Um, and um, the, we got testimonials from every, you know, wine, every wine person and uh, kind of got kicked back into Brandon and I to do homework, which we haven't done. So it was to look at other communities and how they deal with outdoor wine tasting on private property. Um, you know, we've always been a pretty, a little bit of a staid community. Um, we have a, we have, I think, necessarily so, a conservative relationship with alcohol. I, I know I've preached that, so I know that, and I've maybe overset it, so everybody knows what my thoughts are. But I think this meeting really opened up my mind because we got, we got testimony from the wine, the wine makers, if you will, and they really understood that and they really wanted to treat our community in a respectful manner as well. So anyway, homework assignments back in our court, we just haven't done it yet. It's a low priority, it should stay there. We'll continue to work on it. Talk to you in September. I'll comment on this item. <coughs> Joe's coming up. Joe, you wanna talk about wine? No. no. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm, I'm finished anywhere. about the wine. Uh, I finished I the one. With the recommendation. Oh, you want to you make a comment? Just let me grab you the microphone over here. This one's wireless. You can sit in my chair, though. I have a comment. Uh, not about this, though. Uh oh. oh. Well, let us finish we'll just come Yes, over. that's what I wait, was waiting yeah, for. We'll finish up this one with a little closing comment from the county. Yeah. Okay, so we, I have no problem leaving this where it is. Yeah, I just have one question. Is this just the outdoor on the patio thing or is this this whole new designation of wine tasting that jack gallant has talked about yeah the licensing is outside our control okay yeah so it's outside our control this is just the outdoor wine tasting now again the, we, we don't actually allow wine tasting we have the, the selling of wine in our village is a retail use with an ancillary, a very small ancillary, you know, 
Mrs. Toomey and I are going to, I'm sorry, Mr. Toomey and I are having chicken for dinner. We want to taste a couple of wines before we purchase one to take home to drink with dinner. They're not where you're going in and drinking wine. That's not the purpose. And so um, to answer your question, <laughs> to answer your, it, it, so it's just the first question, council member, about, about uh, wine tasting outdoors. And I know your concerns, ma'am, and uh, the other council members do as well. So uh, Brandon and I have already talked about a litany of, of conditions of approval. If we would allow this, that would, would ensure that, uh, again, the character of the village is protected. Does that answer okay. your question? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, well, we have it's separate from changing designations. How yes. we yeah. uh, work on it remaining tasty, not wine bar. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, we have direction. Okay. So now we're going to close up the meeting. We can get Joe, you had a closing comment? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. I hear the words ad hoc a lot, and I'm just hoping that with these ad hoc committees that they're using the public community as well with the ad hoc, and it's not just two people who are the ad hoc and no one else. That's my comment. Thank you. Well, Brandon, Brandon, what is the Latin definition of ad hoc? <laughs> I know. I, yeah, I'll go see it was Bravo. I couldn't see Councilmember Gramoff anymore. The dog has taken over. Uh, so under the Brown Act, um, under the Brown Act, the Brown Act allows ad hoc committees, which are for a specific purpose, uh, obviously can't be a majority of a council or a board to meet. Um, uh, what our ad, ad hocs um, sometimes do, Joe, Todd, are they meet to help define the assignment prior to inviting in the public and having public meetings. So every ad hoc is different. Uh, I know that there are some people that would like to have every ad hoc meeting be a community, you know, community meeting. But but again, some of the ad hocs like to meet to help. I, I think Councilmember Richard, you you've helped me define that is to understand what 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 we're working on prior to um, addressing the, the the greater community. Well, I, I think that some some of the items have are more detail oriented in the beginning. And yeah. So you have to have some fact finding before you present it to the general public because you have to have some answers to the questions that are going to be asked at that first meeting otherwise you're just writing questions down and then right. going and finding the answers yeah the contrast would be you know when when you and council member Felito were on the housing ad hoc we knew what the homework assignment was right and the state said thou shalt develop a revised housing element so that was that was pretty well known. Some of the some of the topics that the ad hocs deal with, well, the it's ambulance less well one defined. was perfect because the ambulance one we brought in five members of the community that had really no partiality to whether we keep the ambulance or farm the ambulance out. And yeah. so it was it was a little bit it was just different. I think they're all a little bit different. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up now. I want to thank the public for their patience today, their participation. And the professionalism. It's been a great meeting. Sorry, we'll have to go back to the normal rigid way I run a meeting before, but this is a great forum. We can actually participate in an open dialogue. It's been great. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Appreciate it.